Recording in progress. We are now recording on Zoom. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, the April 11th meeting of the BART Board of Directors. Uh, I would now ask our district secretary to call the roll. Certainly. Director Ames? Here. Vice President Foley? Present. Director Lee? This is Director Janice Lee. I need to participate in this meeting via teleconference under the just cause provision of California Government Code Section 54953. F because I need to provide care for my mother. Um, there is no one else in the room with me, but if I change rooms in this house, um, it will be uh, my mother um, who will be here with me. Thank you. Director Rayburn? Here. Director Saltzman? Here. Director Simon? Here. Director Allen? 
President Dufty. Here. Thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you so much. Uh, Chief Kevin Franklin, will you lead us in the pledge? Thank you, President Dufty. If everyone would please rise. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, we, we have a, two special guests today, and so uh, we are going to start with an in memoriam, uh, and let me proceed, and then I'll call on the chief and, and then um, Officer Edwards. In memoriam for BART Police Canine Dexter, it's with the heavy hearts that we announce the sudden passing of Dexter, a beloved member of our law enforcement family and a dedicated explosive detection canine. Dexter was born in December of 2018 and came to the BART Police Department from the Czech Republic. Dexter served with unwavering commitment alongside his handler, Officer Scott Edwards, ensuring the safety of our passengers each day. Dexter's exceptional training and keen senses made him an invaluable asset in safeguarding our communities and system. His partnership with Officer Edwards was built on trust, teamwork, and a shared mission to protect and serve the people of the Bay Area. The loss of Dexter is deeply felt by Officer Edwards, his family, the entire BART Police Department, and all who had the privilege of knowing him. Officer Edwards is here this morning and we extend our heartfelt condolences to you during this difficult time. Dexter's legacy of service and his devotion to duty will forever be remembered. Dexter's memory will continue to inspire us as we honor his contributions to public safety. Rest in peace, Dexter. Your courage and dedication will be cherished and remembered. Chief, can I call on you? President Duffy, thank you very much. And directors, thank you for uh, recognizing uh, the sad moment. As you know, our number one priority right now is increasing the presence of uniformed personnel in the system for our passengers and our employees. And just as a fun fact, uh, the police dogs are considered to be uniformed personnel. They actually wear a badge and they are uh, sworn in. And so uh, they are a big part of that presence. And I can tell you that uh, the public loves seeing our dogs. They are really terrific dogs. So I'm gonna introduce uh, Officer Scott Edwards here, who uh, has been a longtime canine handler and was the handler for uh, uh, Officer Dexter, canine Officer Dexter. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be here and uh, share my story with Dexter. Um, if I get joked up a couple times, I'm sorry. Uh, I've been with him for a year, exactly a year. So I got him April 1st of last year and he passed away. April 3rd of this year. So it's kind of, it's very hard because we built a pretty tight bond, um, which was uh, really great. I spent more time with him than I did with my own wife, which uh, <laughs> some of you may understand is kind of a good thing <laughs> if your wife isn't here, you know? So uh, he, he listened to all my stresses. Uh, he listened to other people's stresses. Even if you didn't want to hear him, he still listened. Um, when I took him out in public, People, I allowed people to, to pet him. His biggest thing was he loved being around kids. He loved it. He, he let people ride on his back. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh. And um, he let my son do it all the time. Hmm. But, uh, He was fun to be around. My patrol team loved him. My patrol team, you know, we, I would go on. Uh, it's funny because I would let him in the, the door and people walking out, they would, they would stop. Oh, God. Oh, I thought it was a wolf. It's just Dexter. <laughs> Whew. But Dexter would go in there and he'll, he'll go around and he'll, he'll sit next to you. Like if I let him in here, he'll sit next to you and be like, hey, um, I'm going to need you to pet me, please, because I'm not leaving until you guys pet me. And that was his thing, man. He just loved being around people. And when it was time to go to work, he understood it's time to go to work. He handled business. Then it was back to playtime. And that's that's what we did. And, you know, uh, that's how that's how he carried out his life is I, I work 100%. And then when it's time to play, I'll play. So we work at work, have some fun with the people that we worked with. And then we went home. He forgot all about me. And he went straight to my son and my wife and my daughter and was like, hey, you guys are with me. I'm gonna. I'm gonna hang out with you. Dad is. He's not with me right now. So, 
I appreciate you guys for allowing me to be partnered with him. And uh, share it. Oh, geez. And uh, share his life. Yeah. Appreciate that. So, yeah. So it was a great one year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Officer Edwards. Before you step away, I do want to say that you were you kindly mentioned that directors could come and visit with the K-9 unit, yes. and I certainly want to do that. And for other directors that yeah. might be interested, we can work through the chief um, and make that happen. Yes. It would, it would honestly benefit you all if you all went and checked out how the dogs train, how the dogs play, how the dogs interact with, the, with the, the handlers, because once you understand that, you understand how our dogs operate within the system when it comes to protecting against explosives and against other people, yeah. because yeah. that's very important to us to know that you understand like, hey, oh, the dog's working. Let me let him work, because I know when he's done, I get, to, I get to pet the heck out of that dog, <laughs> and I understand it. So it would, it would be in your best interest to just go check him out, say hi, you know, see if you can pet the dog, watch him train, and I'm sure the chief and the upper deputy chiefs will be like, yeah, come on down. We'll do a big group thing if you wanted to, you know? And so, yeah, that, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. So much. So President sorry. Dufty. Yes, Director Rayburn. May I ask the chief one question? Yes. And, and also extend my sympathy to Officer Edwards. Mm -hmm. How many canines do we have on the force now? Uh, right now, I believe we have four active uh, canines on the force. Thank you. I think we've had as many as seven or more. Yes. In the past. So we were working uh, to uh, replace our uh, canine ranks as well. That's it's important. I, do we have to adjust their salary? <laughs> <laughs> they work for padding. <laughs> Thank you, Director. Colleagues will now move forward to the introduction of our other special guest today, Oakland Fire Chief Damon Covington. It's my honor to welcome and introduce our special guest, City of Oakland's new Fire Chief, Damon Covington. Chief, um, welcome and please come up to the podium. Last October, Oakland Mayor Sheng Tao and the City Administrator, Justin Johnson, announced the selection of Damon Covington to lead the Oakland Fire Department. Before this appointment, Chief Covington served an array of capacities over his 24-year career with Oakland Fire, including a firefighter, paramedic, captain of training, special operations chief, deputy fire chief, and most recently, interim fire chief. Chief Covington was also the president of the Oakland Black Firefighters Association from 2016 to 2022, and currently lectures in the undergraduate fire science program at Merritt College as an adjunct professor. BART has a strong and collaborative relationship with the Oakland Fire Department. Our fire life safety and operations staff coordinate with OFD staff on a regular basis, including Deputy Chief Matthew Nicolini, Battalion Chief Anthony Sanders, and Fire Marshal Felicia Bryant. Together, BART and OFD staff have addressed numerous fire life safety hazards posed by encampments in large recreational vehicles along the BART trackway. We look forward to continuing this important work with your team to enhance safety for both Oakland residents and BART riders. Thank you for joining our board meeting today, Chief Covington. Please share any, any remarks that you have for us. Good morning, board president and esteemed BART board members. Uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate the kind words. Uh, it means so much to me to be able to come down and speak to you guys this morning and meet everyone. Um, BART has meant a lot to me as a Bay Area kid. Obviously, growing up, I was on BART a lot, and it means even more as the, as the fire chief. Uh, we are always collaborating with BART, uh, Chief Franklin and the public safety team to make sure that if and when an event happens in BART's jurisdiction, we, we can respond, not just from the Oakland Fire Department standpoint, but from in partnership with BART so that we can make sure our riders get off of BART safely and that we can mitigate incidents uh, as quickly and efficiently as we can. So I truly appreciate the partnership and I know that we're just gonna continue to grow that partnership and become um, even better as a public safety team because we truly are a team, internal and external with all our constituents. So I appreciate your time today, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much Chief Director Simon. Chief, we are so excited that you're our chief, uh, and I'm so excited that you made time uh, to come and visit um, our organization. I just am so excited about what your leadership is going to bring to OFD, and as 
our president stated, you know, being with one agency for almost 30 years, working yourselves, yourself up through the ranks is it's extremely inspiring. And I'm really excited that you are developing a relationship with our new chief, who's fantastic. And again, being an Oakland resident and being a parent, um, I know firsthand how much you love this community. Very few folks in this room know that as a firefighter over 10 years ago, um, now chief then firefighter Covington was at my home when my husband passed away. And uh, seeing the care and love for public safety staff in a time of deep, deep grief, um, you've been on the ground, you've been in people's homes. Um, you've had to go to, to, to doors and inform folks that their folks are no longer with us. You've been extremely gentle and yet forceful about making sure that our encampments are not harming the infrastructure of Oakland. You've been on the ground and down to see you in a leadership position uh, is extremely, extremely beautiful. Um, help us continue to keep BART safe and we're extremely proud of you. And I actually asked our president if we could take a picture with you. Um, again, as a homegrown person who came in as a very young man to now leading a very important critical institution in, in our county, um, we couldn't be more proud to partner with you. Thank you, Director Simon, I appreciate you. Director Rayburn. Chief Covington, it was truly a pleasure to chat with you before the meeting and get to know a little bit about you and your background in Oakland and your family. Uh, also, your uh, built-in interest in BART. And I was pleased to hear that you're familiar with our facilities, you've been in training in many of them, and I was also excited to hear that you've been down to the Hayward Department where they have the BART car, one of our legacy fleets, up on a pedestal, literally, and uh, that your crews are partnering with the Hayward at that training facility. These are critical things for BART and it can help reassure our passengers that the system is safe. Thank you Wish so much. Wish you the best in your work to get full funding for your department with the city of Oakland. Thank you, please call the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna save that video. Okay. Uh, general manager, will you join us with the photograph with the chief? Yeah. Colleagues. So Director Lee, they, the board is taking a photo and it's right in front of your image, so you will also be in the photo. <laughs> Thank you, colleagues. Uh, we've now concluded our special guest introductions. Um, I do not have a specific board president report, but throughout the meeting, I think we'll discuss items that, that I've been involved with um, at this point. So uh, at, at this point, we're gonna go to board matters and um, for a discussion of the District 5 vacancy. Uh, I would like to take a moment to um, thank some staff colleagues, uh, and particularly our district secretary, April Quintanilla, our general counsel, uh, and our deputy general counsel, uh, Gina Zeeland and Amelia Sandoval-Smith. Um, on a very quick basis, we you know, had calls and discussions and to, to look at um, our responsibilities and, and the different decisions that we will have to make um, as it relates to the District 5 vacancy. Um, I'd like to take a moment and just acknowledge that 
Um, all of us have received information uh, from the district secretary that includes uh, the chapter of the district act regarding uh, the board of directors and situations such as this a sample application for appointment to the board of directors for the district five seat and um, authorization consent and release for background information to accompany the application for appointment and by that uh, just simply that background checks are going to be conducted to do our due diligence to make sure any uh, individuals that, that we consider um, are in fact the people that they represent themselves to be. Um, I also want to thank Ms. Zeeland for establishing a draft motion uh, and uh, in specific that, the, that uh, I'll just read the draft motion that uh, the Board of Directors shall fill the District 5 vacancy by appointment pursuant to California Government Code Section 1780D and that district staff are directed to post an application form and instructions on the district's website and publicize the application which shall be submitted by interested candidates as instructed on the application by the deadline of 5 p.m. on. And so this motion uh, does not have a, 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 a closing date, but I wanted to give us an opportunity to talk about it. I do want to also thank um, the Vice President, Mark Foley, who's been involved in all the discussions that, that have taken place. And um, uh, with that, I, I want to give our, our uh, directors an opportunity to offer comments, concerns um, uh, about this aspect. So we'll start with uh, Director Saltzman. Thank you, um, and thank you, uh, President Dufty and staff, for working so quickly to get this together. Um, I think the, the application materials look good. Um, what I'd like to put forward is a motion, is, is the one that Director Dufty just stated, um, but with the applications due two weeks from today on April 25th, and then the soonest we would do interviews and potentially vote would be May 9th. Now, if we can't get to an agreement, that still gives us the second meeting in May, May 23rd, which is before the deadline. So I think it still gives us enough time, but I'm not comfortable giving people less than a week. I want them to have thoughtful responses. I want to give people an opportunity to decide if this is something they want to do. It's a big commitment. Um, so I think having a little bit longer time for people to apply makes sense. Ideally, we could give them a lot longer, but we're you know we're a little bit crunched here for time. So I think given that it's kind of already out there that this is open, um, I think that that's the timeline that makes sense. So that is uh, my motion. I'll second. Second by our vice president. Um, and before I move to well, Director Rayburn. Well, thank you very much, uh, and thank you, staff, for your support on this effort. Uh, the outreach to the community, I think, is very solid. It's advertised in the stations and the train cars and on the website. Uh, and it is in the best interests of the district to appoint a board member who meets the requir statutory requirements. And I believe that it's in the best interests of the district not to take the vote away from the public on November 5th and that we appoint somebody who can serve in, in this position honorably as a placeholder uh, until the voters have their say. Uh, I want to raise, I feel the urgency behind this. There's already been a meeting canceled on account of an, the vacancy, uh, the capital corridor budget adoption meeting was canceled for April 17th. Um, we're not able to meet a quorum. Uh, for a two-thirds majority. So there's a very real impact to not having a full board. As well, excuse me, I, I'm, if my thoughts get uh, discombobulated if I hear a lot of side chat. Um, but I also want to share that this isn't the first time this has happened in the agency, and I'm the only one on the dais right now who does remember in 2012 when District 3 uh, had a resignation, and we filled it with 
a very experienced uh, candidate. It was former supervisor, the late Mary King. And she served honorably for three or four months. Uh, and then uh, there was an election following that. And Rebecca Salzman's here uh, as a result of that election. So I think that the precedent's very clear for this board to follow. If anything, I would urge that this is urgent and that we should even take action uh, within this month uh, if we could agree on a suitable candidate. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Director Rayburn, and your comments remind me that I should acknowledge um, Alicia, Alicia Trost and her team for so quickly stepping in and, and making material available. And I do want to say that um, recently I, I went, I was at a Daly City Council meeting and um, they were considering an appointment and there were a, a nine candidates. And so um, I am interested in uh, establishing an ad hoc committee and the, the membership would be uh, for directors, the directors that, um, that we know will be here uh, in, in 2025. So uh, Vice President Foley would chair and then directors Rayburn, Ames and Lee would all participate in the ad hoc committee if we had more than 10 applications and there was some value in, in having a, a screening take place. Uh, Director Simon. No, I, the question that I had was somewhat answered, but uh, just in terms of before we move on this, should we have a closing date? We have a closing date for um, the applications based on this current motion, but should we put a bookend date to the end of the process? It's just a question, and I'm not sure if we need to, and then maybe that's a question for our general counsel. Good morning. Um, well, there is a deadline of May 27th to complete this process. Otherwise, the Board of Supervisors um, may make the appointment. So um, while this board is always able to set a special, schedule a special meeting in addition to its regular meetings, um, I believe May 23rd is the last regular board meeting scheduled. Yes, yeah, so that, um, I apologize. Thank you for that. Because that, so my question was in terms of our book and did it need to be different than the, what the statute would, would dictate? Not necessarily. I mean, you could schedule a special board meeting for May 27th and yeah. get it done on the very last day. Got it. Yeah, okay. That might be cutting it a bit too close for some people's Makes comfort. Sense. Okay. Thank you. But that's a great question. Thank you. Director Saltzman. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to bring up two things. One, I, I think Director Rayburn raises one good point, which is uh, it would be good for our president to bring to us at our next meeting some new appointments to committees. I don't believe the Capitol Corridor meeting was canceled just... <laughs> because of one person, my understanding is a whole bunch of people couldn't come, not BART folks. Um, so I don't, I don't think that was canceled because of him. But it's true that we could have issues with quorum for other meetings. So I think in the interim, it would be good to have some new appointments to committees. Um, and then I would have to say, I though I was not on the board, I remember very well the board process to appoint for Bob Franklin's uh, vacant seat because I was already running at that time. And so I was watching it very closely. The difference in that case was because of the timing of when he resigned, the filing had already closed when the board was voting on who to appoint. Because the filing won't have even opened by the time we have to appoint somebody, there's absolutely no way for us to know that somebody we appoint will be a placeholder because they could decide they like it and they could decide to run. So I don't we could try to do that, but there's no way to guarantee and there's no way to stop somebody from running. It's happened many times in the Bay Area where somebody was appointed as a placeholder, including mayor of San Francisco, and they ended up running. So we just we don't have control over that. And I think that's what makes this difference. I appreciated that the board at the time decided to appoint a placeholder, um, but they had that ability and we, we don't have that ability now. Anybody could run. So I think we should look at the candidates and decide who's who's best qualified and go from there. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other colleagues? So should we open this up to public comment? Are there any speaker cards or public comment speakers online? I don't I don't see any in-person speakers, but we do have a hand on Zoom. Great. 
Okay, we'll go to Alita. Alita, please go ahead. Um, thank you. Uh, good morning. Hope you can hear me, uh, President Bevan Dufty and members. Um, Alita Dupree, for the record, my pronouns are she and her. I'm with Team Folds. Um, I, my housekeeping is I am not able to attend you with you in person because I am having lunch in the Oyster Bar in Grand Central Terminal, which is a legendary and historic railroad station located in New York City. So anyway, about this item. Um, I believe I have standing to speak on this matter because this is a weighty matter which involves appointing a decision maker just like you. And I don't know what your criteria will be. And I don't know much about the personalities of the populace of District 5. But I would hope that as you consider these candidates, that they're going to look at, at BART from a regional perspective. Um, I, I would hope that this person would be accepting of, of people who are different like myself, uh, because uh, we are everywhere in the Bay Area and all over the place. So I would ask those questions. That's what I would do. If I was in your seats, I'd say, can you accept people who are different from you? Uh, I would like to, somebody who hopefully has a desire to participate in the building of the best public transportation system that we can have. And uh, hopefully somebody who has experience on BART and, and hopefully on other systems, somebody who can bring a national and international perspective uh, to the matters of BART. Uh, I hope this person would not recoil when I come to the boardroom or, or when I uh, come and speak uh, before you. I would like to meet this person so I hope that your criteria uh, will emphasize the soft skills that are needed. It's not just about making decisions about money and contracting and policy and ordinances, but I would hope that you would impress upon the candidates this ideal that I believe that should be their most important qualification. I ask that they share this with me, that they too will believe in and practice the ideal that part is the people system. Thank you. Any additional speakers? I don't see any additional hands raised. Thank you. And I, I do want to assure Mr. Pre and appreciate that you're with us, even though you're across country, that we absolutely will be concerned to have a director uh, that respects, supports, and, and enhances uh, respect for diversity and inclusivity and safety. Um, so colleagues, with that, um, we have a motion and a second. And if we can go to the roll on that item. Yes. Oh. I just want to clarify, this is the original motion that was made by you, uh, President Tufte, or? Uh, the, so the motion actually was made by oh, Director apologies. Saltzman, took yes, the motion that you prepared motion. Yep. and then put a date on it. And so that is, so it is in April fact your motion, yep. except for the blank line. Yeah. So everyone comfortable with that? Okay. Yes. Director Ames. Yes. Vice President Foley. Aye. Director Lee. Yes. Director Rayburn. Yay. Director Saltzman. Yes. Director Simon. Yes. Director Allen. Yes. President Dufty. Yes. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. And uh, I will certainly work with the district secretary in terms of uh, vacancies now and make sure that anything that is necessary to fill, um, that we do it expeditiously and consider the establishment of an ad hoc committee in the event that we have a large number of applicants and it is appropriate to do an initial screening before the full board. So thank you so much, colleagues. I appreciate this and I appreciate all the support that we've received from our executive team and all of the uh, key, key staff um, working on this with us. So thank you all so much. Um, we're gonna go next to the consent calendar and um, following uh, the consideration of the consent calendar, Director Ames is gonna have an exchange with a, a couple of our BART uh, key staff. And so I am inquiring, does any member wish to sever an item from the consent calendar? Seeing none. Uh, I would like to move approval of the consent. Thank you so much. And second? Second. Thank you. Uh, so if, uh, it, are there any public comment speakers for this item? 
I don't see any in-person speakers or hands on Zoom. Thank you. So we'll proceed to the vote. Director Ames? Yes. Vice President Foley? Aye. Director Lee? <coughs> yes. Director Rayburn? Yay. Director Saltzman? Yes. Director Simon? Yes. Director Allen? Yes. President Dufty? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you so much. And we will now go to Director Ames. Thank you. I'd just like us staff to briefly talk about this project on item five here um, regarding paratransit software services. And my concern overall with paratransit is um, I looked at the East Bay paratransit coverage. It didn't include Contra Costa County stations such as, you know, Walnut Creek or, you know, even out to Antioch. I mean, it is a big area, but in looking at the this contract, I thought this is an opportunity to look at consolidation or maybe a broader scope of services to those outer areas. And I found out that MTC in 2012 approved a transit sustainability project and had findings to create an East Bay, inner East Bay comprehensive operational analysis on transit. And I sent this to staff. And so, and then also, that resulted in the formation, a recommendation of a formation of a consolidated transportation service agency, which didn't get approved in Contra Costa. This was in 2013, um, because it's rather complex, but we're dealing with this issue right now. We're trying to look at consolidation and collaboration. So I talked to Contra Costa transportation uh, folks, and they said they are trying to work with paratransit for, you know, the East Bay paratransit right now to do the one seat ride to say Walnut Creek, those outer areas and the Contra Costa area. So I'd like you to just comment a little bit about the software and the ability of this being able to work with this idea of expanding services. Or maybe you just want to do an overview first and then launch into this. Um, so thank you for those questions. So this software is for East Bay Paratransit, which is the overlapping territories of BART and AC Transit. The current software is, uh, is will no longer be supported by the vendor. So we have to, uh, it's a federal mandate to offer this service in, in this particular area. Uh, this is a new software. It's, it's by a company that's young and, and fleet and, and are, it, it's, it's open and um, it can be um, expanded to other agencies. Um, Ravi and, and Angie did a great job of negotiating a great package to lock in a price uh, the highest tier, so it, it, it won't cost more um, to expand it to other properties. But, but right now we're concentrating on East Bay paratransit. We are participating in one seat pilot, the, the, the discussion with MTC on a regional level. We also are involved with um, Contra Costa. At, you know, they've set up something, but we're in discussions with them. So we're um, a regional, we're, we're inter interested in regional efforts on, on this in paratransit. Thank you for that, and I just want to encourage, yeah, the, the Contra Costa right now is trying to reach out with East Bay Paratransit, you know, as, as a one-on-one -on -one conversation, trying to get that one seat right over to the further air, outer areas. So I hope this can work out with the software, and then I guess it sounds like we're working together. And I just want to highlight that MTC asked for this, this you know, this consolidation back in 2012, and it kind of ties into the later uh, item we're going to talk about. Uh, on consolidation of transit services. And so I just think it's a fantastic that MTC thought about this over 10 years ago. And it was studied by Contra Costa County, but then it was tabled um, because it was complex to deal with all the different agencies. But I'm glad to see it's happening with paratransit. We'll start there, ho hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. Director Allen. Allen. Yeah, don't go away. Sorry. Just a quick question. Um, Bob, you and I have talked about this over the years about how can we increase the efficiency and the effectiveness of paratransit uh, services. And a few years ago, we were talking about new technologies, new um, really micro transit, almost Uber like services for people with disabilities and how that in the end uh, really just providing vouchers to people like that could be much more cost effective than the route type of service that we provide now. Are we moving anywhere in that or did that all sort of go away? 
Uh, there's a couple of things with this. This new software, one thing that I think is, is really innovative in this is with the current software, uh, the, the driver is given, the, uh, is a manifest at the beginning of the day. Here are your 10 pickups. And if there's a cancellation, if someone's running late, they may be removed, but the, the route continues. With this new software, after each drop off or pickup, the assignment at the next pickup is is um, is dynamic, so the the driver doesn't know in advance what their plans are for the day, so it's more like an Uber driver where they drop off someone and now they're going to the mo the most efficient place for them. I think that'll really help with efficiencies. I mean, in terms of using Lyft and Uber, one of the big problems is that they they're they're not a wheelchair accessible vehicle, so we are exploring and increasing. Um, uh, looking at a smaller vehicle, um, it, it will be coming next month with a, a new broker contract, and, and that'll be part of the discussion. But that, that, that is a consideration for what the broker is providing. Good. So it sounds like maybe we're making some progress. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Um, colleagues, we'll now move on to the general manager's report. Good morning, President Dufty, Bart, Board of Directors. A couple of updates from the general manager. Uh, please tune us. I think I talked about this a little bit before, but um, Take Your Kids to Work Day is Thursday, April 25th. And we're pleased to announce that we're going to be participating in that and hosting. And that is, I believe, also a Bart board meeting. And uh, Yes, it will be, and I think it'll be an opportunity for um, uh, the kids that participate to see democracy in action, and we have encouraged folks to, to uh, populate the BART boardroom um, if they're so inclined, and um, so uh, it is April 25th on that, and uh, there's going to be celebrations across the nations, but at BART there'll be stuff at, you know, at BART headquarters here, at BART Police Headquarters, and it'll be a nice day to um, take your kids to work day. So this year's theme, the theme for this year is Inspire to Aspire, um, and engaging youth to explore the dream and their futures while learning about the world of work and how home and community lives are connected. They so are connected. Um, Anyway, we're going to have a lot of stuff here at the at the Met Auditorium over at the, the Chiefs headquarters there and here, but um, some of the events are going to be attend the Bart board meeting uh, as special guests, and we'll brief, obviously, President Dufty and Vice President Foley on how the mechanics of that will work. We're going to have meet the power team. That's our electronics discovery and demonstrations. The police will have uh, an, ev an evidence demonstration. The K-9 unit, we just heard a little bit there, um, is going to have a presentation. Our track folks will be there. There will be a station agent visit. Um, it'll be, it's going to be a nice event on April 25th, so I just didn't want you to be caught off guard with, um, on the 25th when this event unfolds there. And so just then five days earlier, you should have got an email from Alicia Trost from the communications department on, uh, I think it went out yesterday or the day before, Mike? Something like that? Tuesday. And this is on um, our ride to the future, ride into the future. And it's very well thought through. And um, Alicia's finalizing with Rod's help and others um, the run of show for that event with President Dufty and others. And so um, I would encourage you to mark that on your calendars and participate if you can on that. Um, another update, if you haven't been to Civic Center Station lately, which I go to quite often, um, the new fare gate at the elevator, this is on the platform. It's the elevator from the platform that goes up to the concourse level. Um, Sylvia has installed and is in revenue service the next generation fare gate that's there. I've been out there, I've watched it in, in, in action, um, and she's figuring out the next steps there on um, mobbing into the primary and secondary ends at Civic. So if you're out at Civic Center Station, use the elevator there and you'll see the new fare gate working um, there. Um, 
And, uh, you know, I did want to take a moment to thank our track and structures team, the buildings team, the electrical comms, AFC maintenance. That was our frontline folks that installed that out there. Um, and they did the lion's share of the work at West Oakland as well. And all of this um, is going to help us as we roll out for further installations across the system with our frontline folks. So just a, a shout out to the folks that have installed that and are continuing to do that. And then Rod is right in here. Rod's team, he did a nice job. If you didn't know about this, you know, that's one reason is because Rod and his team went out to the to the city of San Francisco and the businesses and the disabilities communities out there, Lighthouse for the Blind, and make sure, hey, this is happening, this is happening. And so he's done a nice job there in coordinating and communicating with that. And again, that's going to be the model that we're going to use. Um, and so that we didn't misstep on these first two is, is pretty good confidence that we have our act together moving forward. Uh, so thank you, Rod, for you and your team on that. Um, this weekend, we're having our, um, is it the, our final our line shutdown, ma'am? Madam CTO is sitting up here. Maybe she should give this, but I'll do it. Um, this is our final our line shutdown between El Cerrito del Norte and the Richmond Yard. Um, it's, uh, we're pretty wired, we, we are wired tight on this thing. We'll have a bus bridge and we're gonna do the final resurface, surfacing, replacing of some pads, some punch list stuff, some tree removal. And so this will wrap up the work on the R line that's out there. Um, ridership, we are, has remained constant over uh, from March 25th to April 1st, um, which is um, right on line with our budget projections there. Um, and then I did want Tara to take a few minutes and um, walk the board through uh, the um, uh, challenges that we had out in opening the system out at Antioch just a few days back. So Tara, why don't I turn this over to you? Thank you. Good morning, President Dufty, board members. On Wednesday, April 3rd, at approximately 4.30 a.m., a three-car DMU train leaving Antioch Yard experienced a derailment between the yard and Antioch Station. Our preliminary investigation revealed that prior to revenue service, track <coughs> inspectors were performing inspections and placed a derailed de safety device with a flag up for protection from trains. After the track inspections, the crew cleared the area and confirmed that the device was placed in the non-derail position, but unfortunately it wasn't, causing the first revenue train to derail. Due to the location of the derailment, we were unable to dispatch trains to provide service from Antioch to Pittsburgh Bay Point stations. At 5 a.m., Tri-Delta did an exceptional job by providing mutual aid and a bus bridge within a short period of time. Transportation, track and structures, rolling stock and shops, and safety responded to the incident between 5.30 a.m. and 6 a.m. Safety completed their inspection and released the incident area for re-railing at approximately 6.10 a.m. At 9.21 a.m., the car was re-railed and preparations to move the car back into the yard were initiated. At 9.44, the incident was released and regular service was restored from Antioch Station at 10.12 a.m. As an immediate corrective action, we have implemented two-person inventory and equipment checks prior to clearing the trackway instead of relying on one person performing the checks. Retraining and corrective action plans have been initiated as the active, as the active incident investigation continues. Thank you. Thank you so much. So President Dufty, let me just jump in a second. The, uh, it's kind of important. The legacy ride um, was, the email went out to all of you yesterday and what we need out of each one of you, if you're interested in, is, a, is an RSVP. And so if you could RSVP, then we can get that into the run of show and, and match all that up with Alicia and um, Rod's team. So if I could 
just edit my earlier statement there. I'm the MC, so I think I'm there. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Colleagues, any questions for the general manager? Director Ames? Yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what happened over there at the yard. Um, and Director Ames, it's, can it might I, be my hearing aid. I need to hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Louder. It must be I my mask. I have a cold. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. Sorry. Thank you. I just wanted to understand a little bit what happened. So we had a, a manual switch at the yard, and that caused the train to go into this derailment mode. Or was it an, a manual switch in the yard that made this happen? And now you're you're going to have two people check this, or it was an electronic. It was a, it's a manual derail. It was a manual. That was placed on the trackway to protect personnel when they're performing okay. track inspections. Okay, so it was a manual switch out there. A they, derail. A derail. Right, it was not a switch. It, it's okay. designed to derail a train. It's put up for protection. So if something goes into that area, it will not allow it to go into that right. area so that you can't, you know, make contact with, with uh, people. And is there a way to also do this electronically with a sig like the computerized system where you could see that that switch was not, that switch was engaged so that you couldn't operate? I mean, was there also a, you know, you know a computer based system that would look at this as well? Just not, curious. Not in the, the, on the E line for the DM okay. trains. It's different Got for it. our core bar. This is manual system. Okay, I understand. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Director Simon. Um, thank you for the presentation. I'm curious to how many riders were affected or how many, do we know how many folks um, took the bus bridge during the, the outage? Just curious, the impact. I do not have those numbers, but we were provided three buses mm -hmm. um, as a bus bridge and from Tri-Delta, and we were also provided mutual aid by them. So. Most of the passengers did get on the bus bridge or a mutual aid bus. I can get those numbers. Yeah, it's not not mandatory. I'm just I know less about that end of the line in the early morning, especially post COVID. Um, and I know no matter if it's five passengers or ten, you still need to get that bus there, right? And so I was just curious of sort of what the, the impact was on riders. So I'll loop back with you. Thank you, Director Rayburn. Thank you, President Dufty, and thank you, uh, General Manager, for your report. Uh, you didn't mention anything about the Earth Day tree planting. Uh, is is that still one slated more, for Director the- Director Raven, one, I, I didn't catch the- which You didn't mention anything about the Earth Day tree planting that- uh, Did not. Uh, are you familiar with? I am. Uh, somebody must be. I, I certainly, um, being um, a I know I guy. signed up, yeah. but I wanted to just no, verify. Who's one of that Val or Rudd? Earth Day tree planting? Let me get back to you, Director Rayburn, on that. Wow. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, seeing no further questions, we'll open this item up for public comment. Are there any public comment speakers? No in-person speakers, but we do have a hand on Zoom. Thank you. So we'll go to Alita. Alita. Um, <clears throat> thanks again, uh, President Bevan Dufty and members. Uh, Alita Dupree for the record. She and Harwood team holds from Grand Central Terminal. Um, you know, I appreciate Bob's meaningful, incredible reports. Uh, I, I am saddened about this derailment. Um, uh, this is not good. Uh, this does not uphold the ideal of what a great legendary railroad should look like. So I, I expect accountability. Um, uh, people should be held accountable for their work. And if people are not doing things the way they should, I expect uh, that action will be taken because um, anybody could be on a train at any time. I could be on a train at any time. And I'm different, which puts me at the greatest risk. So uh, we, we need to do a deep dive into why that happened. Um, I, I have heard about the ride along that will happen on the 20th. I don't know if I'll be there. I'm interested, but I see we are running uh, two train sets. And uh, you know I don't take crowds very well. I did a, a ride in uh, 
Los Angeles, the new blue line in 2016. I mean, it was just packed real, real crowded. I was on second train, so I, I'm not sure if I'm going to do that. But, but uh, I look forward to hearing uh, how that goes. And uh, ridership uh, is essential. Um, definitely want to keep up with the numbers. We're getting there. Uh, I, I hope we can move past this derailment because I don't want people to be scared off from using BART. Uh, it's not like in New York. I think New York is tracking 75, even 80%. So we want to try to get that here on BART. Uh, so uh, we, we got to stay tight with all this. But I appreciate the reports of Bob Powers, uh, who has ridden on the trains with me. Uh, and why is that? Is because Bob's reports emphasize the idea of BART being the people's system. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Pree. Any additional? Yes. Yes, uh, we do have a speaker. I believe Glenn Overton would like to speak on this item. Thank you. Well, things happen, isn't that something? I don't know how many of you have laid rail by spike. I have, miles of it. And then had the opportunity to operate a streetcar, which was 30 miles long one way. So I sort of seen it from both ends. I had an occasion where a switch opened in the mid point of the streetcar where the rear, rear trucks went down one track and the trolley was going down the street sideways. Of course, I don't know why that happened. No one ever reported to me why that switch failed when it was poised to go straight and open up before I got my rear trucks through. And these things happen. So uh, there's no sense uh, fretting over it. Let's fix the problem and get on with it, because guess what? We got to do that anyway. We have to get on with it. Thank you, Mr. Overton. I don't believe we have any additional speakers. Great. Thank you. So we will now conclude this item, and we'll move on to item seven, which is public comment. And I have speaker forums from Mr. Barney Smiths and then from Mr. Overton. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to this board. My name is Barney Smits, and I'm a licensed professional engineer and transit user. I am here today to speak about VTA's BSV2 project. The current 40% design is more expensive, takes longer to construct, and is less safe than the 60% twin board design currently sitting on the shelf. Today's BSV2 topics are compliance and safety. One, tunneling and compliance with the environmental regulations. Two, safety critical mid-tunnel vent facilities, and three, code compliance or BART safety standards. One, the tunnel boring rule of thumb is two times the tunnel diameter of cover is necessary to prote protect against building subsidence and near surface underground utility damage. How can VTA claim that tunneling under Santa Clara Street will be safe with the platforms being 85 feet below the surface? The current 54-foot diameter tunnel would require 108 feet to the top of the tunnels, which would put the platforms 140 feet underground. Are the property owners and both boards aware of this potential risk? How much damage might result from deviating from this tunnel boring requirement? So why has none of this been provided to either board with updated CEQA and SEIR SEIS documents? Please note that the 2001 Comprehensive Agreement requires that both boards approve the environmental reports. This is not a problem if the project returns to the twin board design. Two, where are the mid-tunnel vent structures? The project seems to be hiding this from everybody. These safety critical facilities are currently indicated in both the single bore and twin board designs and were part of the SEIR SEIS documents approved in 2018. These vital facilities provide access, egress, fire protection, water, emergency ventilation, etc., that have been the target for cost savings by the project. 
but this change would reopen the environmental process. Returning to the twin bore design would include the safety critical facilities and avoid additional environmental review. Three, BART's approach to safety has never been meeting the minimum code requirements. While VTA continues to try novel and new approaches which do not always meet the code requirements and rarely meets BART's higher safety standards, they continue to point to their safe on paper versus BART's 50 plus years of proven safety. The twin bore and the two mid-tunnel vent structures offer safety and better access for passengers, employees, and first responders. In addition to cheaper operating and maintenance costs, the twin bore design should save a minimum of $3 billion as well as meet BART's safety standards. Please consider the current effort of throwing good money after bad and insist on returning to the faster, cheaper, and safer twin bore design. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional? Oh, Mr. Overton. Board of Directors and General Manager and Assistants, I have a message from the past from Abraham Lincoln. See if, what you can gather from this. He says, fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. This administration will be remembered in spite of itself. No personal significance or insignificance can spare any of us the fiery fire from which we go will light us down in history, whether we like it or not. Lincoln also goes on to say, the dogmas of the past are too simple to solve our problems. And since they are, that we should think anew. What does that mean? That means rising to the occasion, understand the change that we are going through here. That the environment, the citizenry requires safe, clean transit at all times. You have a job on your hands. And I have all the confidence in the world you will meet that demand. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Overton. Director Allen. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to just a brief response to Mr. Smith's. Um, first, I want to thank him for his diligence in continuing to come to this board and pointing out uh, issues of concern with um, with the VTA and the um, BART to Silicon Valley extension. And uh, later in the meeting, when we get to um, board matters, um, uh, Director Ames and I will be introducing an RCI uh, with respect to uh, an information request um, regarding that uh, BART to Silicon Valley project. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, with that, um, I no additional speakers. Oh, we do have additional. Great. Yes, thank you. We do have a couple hands on Zoom, so we'll go first to Alita. Alita, please go ahead. Um, thanks again, uh, President Bevan Duffy and members. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her with Team Folds representing Skirt Folds, uh, broadcasting from Grand Central Terminal in New York City. I, I speak generally, and um, I think I've been speaking at BART for about seven years. And I enjoy speaking at meetings wherever I am and, and I am seeking safety and I write you letters about the importance of seeking safety how can I feel safe on BART and not just on the system but in your meetings uh, I'll write letters to help you to understand my feelings because it is not easy for me as a person with disabilities who is different than wearing a skirt to attend your meetings. 
but it is you that helps me to attend your meetings by showing me the welcome. And I don't talk the talk, but I walk the walk. I can talk about the subway all day, but today I used it. I have 54 years of experience in riding the New York City subway, almost the entire system. And so I tried to bring my experience, this is 54 years of public transportation to you, because it helps to give context as to why I feel the way I do about things. But how do I gain equal standing in BART? Uh, I am fortunate for some answers that I have gotten. I did get to speak to a person uh, who I will not name, who was able to speak with authority and credibility, uh, who has assured me uh, that at this time we are not going to curtail the 62.5% discount for senior and disabled users. Uh, so, so I'm very great, grateful for that. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, because I, I would like to see from for all of you, uh, it, it's not just about Clipper Starts but that RTC discount is a way of recognizing the unique needs of senior and disabled users. It's not the same as skipping fare on the subway. Uh, and I uh, am working on a letter about a good time that I had in West Oakland uh, with the new fare gates. And I got to meet a station agent who was really exemplary, but not just exemplary in um, their conduct and handling of their work in the booth at West Oakland, but it is the welcome that this person showed me into the system, uh, evaluating me as a person in bar and appreciating my presence in bar. Uh, I hope that I will meet many people like that in bar who have that exemplary welcoming attitude. And it's because of this reason that BART is the people system. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alita. Okay, and our next speaker is Joe. Joe, please go ahead. Oh, thank you, District Secretary. Uh, Joe Kunzler here. A um, bit of a serious situation going on right now. I've emailed Alicia Trost a few times. I'm, I've also emailed some of you on the board. Um, at Free Dirty today, the Oakland Port Commission is considering a controversial name change to Oakland International Airport, an airport I fly into from time to time to ride your BART system and visit some of the greatest people on earth like Catherine, Stephanie, Elisa Trust, and uh, some of your great luminaries. And also check out your bridges. You have great bridges and you have awesome ferries. But we, we need to get a little serious here because sadly, uh, the Oakland Port Commission uh, today at 3.30 p.m. is going to vote on changing the name of Oakland International Airport to, wait for it, San Francisco Bay, Oakland International Airport. Um, as a friend of BART, I'm deeply concerned. I think this could lead to someone getting on the wrong train to the wrong airport. They could be wanting to go to SFO and they end up going to most of the way to Oakland before realizing where they are. Or they could be trying to catch a flight to out of Oakland and instead they had, because of the San Francisco Bay name, they start getting on trains to SFO. Um, this is a real uh, issue for transit riders, but I've yet to see the transit community wake up to this. I know the city government of San Francisco has passed a resolution in condemnation. I know the city attorney has passed a um, resolution plans to sue if the name change happens, which is likely. But where is BART? Where is Mooney? Where Where is the MTC? Where is the transit community on this? Because this is going to mess you guys up. So I'm just trying to be friendly and sound the alarm today. And it's, I also greatly appreciate the remote access to meetings here at BART so I can help you guys out when I can. Thanks for all you do, keep being awesome. See you around. Thank you. There are no additional hands raised. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Vice President Foley. Thank you, President Dufty. I just wanted to ask staff, are we tracking the issue with the renaming of the airport as it does potentially impact wayfinding for us and and have we been engaged in any way? Good morning, Directors. Uh, Michael Jones, Deputy General Manager. Of course, obviously we're tracking it. We've seen it. It's been all over the news. We have not engaged uh, uh, officially with uh, the Oakland Airport or SFO, but we certainly can uh, put that on our to-do list, sir. 
I simply would like to track it if you can just let us know where this goes. I'm sure it'll be in the news, but I'd be interested to see what the potential impacts would be to BART. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. Um, colleagues, now we're going to move into administration items, and I'll take this opportunity to uh, thank Janice Lee, the chair of this committee. I want to thank her for uh, participating remotely, which is not easy, and to extend our best wishes to uh, her mom, Psyche, who is recovering uh, from, from uh, a very serious health scare. Um, so given the difficulty of chairing items uh, remotely, I want to thank Director Rayburn, who is a very robust calendar already at, at PPAL and appreciate him as vice chair of the admin committee for leading us through the discussion on the next two items. Thank you for your faith, President Dufty. Uh, we have two items on the administration calendar today. One is a continuation of an item that was first introduced in the consent calendar at the last meeting. We'll have a full presentation on the Workman's Comp third party administration and related services. We will also, item B, discuss uh, the most important issue facing this agency over the next two years, and that's our fiscal year 25 and fiscal year 26 preliminary budget. So thank you, Director Rayburn. That was a good introduction. The first item is an action item, and you all know Rosalind Volz, our Director of HR, and Rod Maplestone, he's our Manager of Leap Management. Uh, Rod is bringing to us today a short presentation to cover the workers' comp item, after which we'll ask, ask the board to consider an action item. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Board members, I'm here today to request permission to enter into agreement with the Athens administrators for the administration of our workers' compensation program, including third-party administrative services, medical case management, and utilization and bill review. Just wanted to review a little bit about our workers' compensation program. Um, the district is a self-insured employer in the state of California, and our program is self-funded to a retention of $4 million. Um, in fiscal year 23, we, we received over 1,000 new workers' comp claims, and we have an average of 800 open claims at any given time. I do want to touch on the three specific scopes of services that we um, are wanting to fill at this time. These are essential services that we're statutory, statutorily obligated to provide to our employees. They include the administration of our workers' compensation program, including reviewing all claims, making a claim determination, paying all bills, and coordinating all services. The second scope is for medical case management, which includes managing the medical components of the claim through telephonic and field-based nurses with the uh, priority of returning employees back to work and facilitating their medical treatment. And then the third scope is the utilization and bill review. And this is to ensure that medical treatment recommended by treating providers are uh, supported by objective medical findings and that the billing that they submit is appropriately billed within the California state fee schedule. Uh, the selection process for this RFP, we, um, it's an unbundled program where we had three separate scopes of services which were each evaluated for separately. Um, we posted in 10 publications and we advanced notified 102 certified small businesses through the state of California via the B2G Now database. Um, we received one response for the TPA services and then four each for the medical case <coughs> management and utilization and bill review. Um, we reviewed uh, written submissions as well as interviewed each of the proposers, and we used the best value method to make our determination. Um, as I said, each scope was individually evaluated, um, and we did find that Athens administrators was selected as the most uh, beneficial to the district for providing each of these services. They had the highest scores in, for each scope, and the panel included members from leave management, labor relations, and the Office of Civil Rights. And then I'd also like to mention that Athens Administrators has been a strong partner for the district since 2005. And with that, I would request board approval to enter into agreement with Athens Administrators. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Do we have any public comments? John Arantes, please come to the microphone.
Good morning, President of the Board, Board of Directors, General Manager, John Arantes, President of Bart Chapter, SEIU 1021. Although we do face some challenges when it comes to workman's comp, they seem to be very slow, but that goes across the United States, all right? And it's causing people to not uh, receive the treatment they need to, for a speedy recovery and get back to work. But throughout the years, we have been able to work with Yvette Ibarra and Athens to address a lot of concerns that our members have raised and uh, been successful. We still have a lot of work to do, all right, going forward but we totally support the Athens to continue to be our administrator going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any commenters online? Vice Chair Rayburn, we actually have another in-person speaker. Glenn Overton would like to speak. Please, Mr. Overton. But I don't see any hands on Zoom. Okay, thank you. On Tuesday of this week, I was lying flat on my back in a surgery room to have a radical replacement of this shoulder. This is a case where I cannot emphasize the need for medical case management. Why? On Monday, I went to, by accident, the dentist to have a teeth cleaning because I knew I did not want to have to bother with that. While I had no use of this arm. Well, the hygienist come out and says, you have an abscess on the third to the rear upper left. I am lying flat on my back, and now I'm getting a nerve block to deaden this arm in that neck here. No one asked me about the connection between infection, which an abscess is, and that operation, which could have taken my life. I don't have to be standing here right now. By accident. Now, this is after the nerve block. If you don't know what a nerve block is, your arm feels like a piece of sausage just dangling there. Now, why did I get the nerve block first before the anesthesiologist come in there and ask me, do you have any loose teeth? That's what then motivated me to say, hey, I have an access. And then the surgeon come out and say, Mr. Overton, we can't do this surgery. And I had to walk around with a dead arm. So now if someone would have examined that situation, they would have found out, well, perhaps maybe elderly people should have dental exams before they have radical. It should be demandatory. But uh, this is just a radical situation. I'm, no, I'm here talking now, so uh, uh, I don't have to be here, as the surgeon said. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Overton. I don't believe any additional public comment. Thank you. And do we have any board comments? Director Allen. Um, well, thank you. A couple questions for you. Um, so in the last meeting, when we deferred this, we tabled this to, to this meeting, um, I had asked for historic loss rates over three years and, and some discussion of, um, you know, what our track record was. And um, you did actually nicely outline that in a memo to us at about 6 o'clock last night. Um, but I'm just wondering why that isn't part of the presentation here to the public. Thank you for your thank you for your question. Um, I wanted to focus on the essentialness of the the services, and we do have a um, annual stewardship that we do with Athens, and I would be able to you know share other information with you. 
I wanted to keep the scope of this focused on how essential these services are and the fact that we need to provide them. Okay, and do you know why we only received one proposal for the TPA portion of the contract? I, I'm not sure about that. I mean, we would have wanted to have more opportunities to explore other you know, partnerships, but we did only receive that one, and I'm not exactly sure why. Okay. Um, is there a reason why Athens is not here to actually do a presentation of what they do in their, the history? Have you thought of that? I, I, I'd like to jump in, Director Allen, if I may. I, I'd think it would probably be inappropriate for Athens to make a presentation when their when staff is asking the board to approve a five-year contract for them so okay. that would that would be my response okay so here, here's here's what I see <clears throat> um, we essentially have rebundled this work it was once unbundled and now we are rebundling it because we're awarding all three parts to Athens, and, and to be clear, Athens is a great company and they do great work for many, many large corporations and organizations, uh, you, you know, in, in private and public sectors. Um, so I have, I have no issue with the company that <coughs> you're, you're proposing that we, were, we award to today. Um, but we, we have rebundled this into one package and because only Athens submitted a proposal on one of the three parts, we are essentially sole sourcing this. We only have one proposal um, that came to us. Now, I reached out to a couple of people I know in the insurance industry, one a very large brokerage, and they said they looked at the proposal, the RFP, when it came out on the street, and that they felt like that there was a very low probability that BART would actually change TPA administrators. I'm not sure why they say that, but maybe that's just how it goes in the industry. I don't know. Um, I, I'm really not concerned about rebundling the three contracts. I think at, in the end we could stand to save more money, and I'm told by people in the industry that um, it's, it is more efficient, more handling, the, the handling of claims is more efficient when the three components are all handled by the same company, so I don't oppose that either. Um, I do share the concerns of SEIU President Arantes about the approval and movement of treatment for our workers who are injured in a, in a swift and efficient and compassionate way so that everyone wins that way. Um, when we slow things down and when we're not efficient in handling of claims and workers have to wait for care, no one wins there. So um, this, you know, that should always be our goal is to efficiently manage these claims. Um, as you, you pointed out some of this in your memo, but um, uh, workers' comp is typically, the, the cost of it is measured in losses per $100 of, of payroll. And I know you gave some numbers in, in your um, memo last night, um, but uh, after I took a look at the actuarial report, um, and thank you for sending that again, um, we had been sent it before, um, there was, there's also actually some of this analysis in this report. Um, so I went through this report with, with an industry professional of 35 years in the workers' comp industry, and, um, and here's what I learned. Um, the Aon actuary has estimated that the loss rate for BART claims has increased from $3.53, uh, and again, this is in per hundreds of payroll, um, for the claims occurring from fiscal years 1819 to $4.83 in 22-23. It's a 37% increase, and um, that translates into an increase in expected ultimate cost from, from um, uh, translates to an increase in expected ultimate cost from 15.6 million for claims in 2018-19 to 23.4 in the 22-23 year. It indicates that the increase, the report indicates that the increase is a result of an increase in the severity of claims, okay? And there are different ways that these costs increase, numbers of claims and severity of claims. 
Um, this is an extraordinary increase compared to most other California employers. The Workers' Comp Insurance Rating Bureau of California reports that for the period 2018 to 22, the average loss rate charged by insurers in California dropped from 2.33 to 1.72. So there's a there's a quite a quite a big difference there between where we're at and what's happening in the rest of California. This drop is attributed to a reduction in claim frequency and increase in wages and modest increases in severity. So when wages go up, which wages have gone up here too, um, you know, that percentage um, actually goes down if the cost of the claims do not rise faster than wages. Um, so in addition to the increase in the loss rate, the actuary reevaluated older claims in this report and increased the expected losses for claims that occurred prior to 7-1-23 by over $5 million compared to their study from six months prior. This signals a deterioration of the results over a very short period of time, and that concerns me too, because that, that actually ultimately hits our bottom line of our financials uh, and our expenditures for the year because we have to increase that reserve. Um, so all of these changes result in an increase to the workers' comp expense of 6.9 million over just a six month period. And we're adding liabilities at a, a greater rate than we are paying and closing claims, it seems. So claim severity is driven by injury type, disability duration, litigation, average lost time, um, and, and average lost time uh, claims cost $60,000 on average, and medical-only claims typically are in the $2,000 range on average. Um, litigation drives that up even higher. Um, while some claims are severe in their, in their nature, many become costly due to breakdowns in the claim management process. And that's what we're really talking about here, is we are hiring a company to manage the claims process. Inattentive claim management and poor communication results in extended disability duration as well as increased litigation. In addition, a well-functioning program ensures employer involvement at every step. The result, and, and my understanding here is that you have three full-time people who are involved in workers' comp claims within BART in-house. Yes, three people on my team. Yep. That doesn't seem a lot, like a lot to me for over a thousand claims. So I, maybe that is something we should visit. Um, that's an aside. The results from the actuarial, actuarial report clearly demonstrate that BART's workers' compensation program is, is not performing well. Extending the Athens contract for three years without addressing the issues that are resulting in the cost increases will likely result in ongoing deteriorating, deteriorating results. Um, you know, it's, you know, it's you do the same thing over and over, you're gonna get the same thing, okay? Um, so I'm proposing that maybe we, we, we do something a little different. Rather than renew the Athens contract, I, I propose that BART extend the existing contracts, which by the way, those contracts expire, expired back in October of last year. So we are just now getting uh, new contracts, which I think speaks to a whole different problem that we have in BART, um, but I won't, won't go into that. Um, but I would propose that we extend the existing contracts for a 12-month period. Um, that gives really seven months left for us to do some work on this. And that um, the work that we ask to be done be done within the Inspector General's office, who already is actually starting to work on something somewhat related to this. And here's what I would ask that, that we do. One, we analyze the lost data to understand what's driving the increase in claim severity. We audit a sample of Athens claim files to gauge their performance. We reissue the RFP to address the current program deficiencies. We ensure a broader scope of qualified TPA responders. And we understand what each TPA would do to address the program deficiencies. Establish performance criteria and performance <coughs> guarantees. We establish measurement and audit parameters. And we select providers and then implement three-year contracts. Um, my substitute motion is this. The general manager is authorized to extend, actually, no one's made a motion, right? 
Okay, here's my motion. <laughs> the general manager is authorized to extend the existing contracts for a period of one year from contract expirations last October for the workers' compensation, third party administration, and related services at prorated rates not to exceed the rates developed for the new contracts. In other words, I'm not expecting these companies to continue to work under the old contract rates. Everything's going up. So one year extension, negotiate um, a reasonable increase in those last year's rates for that one year. Um, and that um, pursuant to notification to be issued by the general manager and subject to compliance with the district protest procedures. The Office of Inspector General is requested to complete an independent analysis within the next six months that includes the eight items I mentioned previously and report to this board as to its recommendations to mitigate the increasing costs of our workers' comp program and provide suggestions. And I can um, actually write this out. Okay, for Director you Allen, to you. I'm going to ask you to wrap up. That's it, that's my motion. Thank Done. you. I'm going to ask before we turn to Director Ames and Director Foley if you've had a chance to discuss this proposal with staff and if they have any comments. Well, this is the first I'm hearing uh, Directors Allen Director Allen's specific concerns or request, I would say that this contract was competitively bid. It is not a sole source that staff is asking you to approve. Uh, we cannot control who bid uh, on our work. It went through the process, and uh, staff's recommendation is that the board approve this item uh, as recommended. Thank you. And I would also note, uh, Chair Rayburn, uh, that it's not my understanding that these contracts are expired. These contracts are still active. Thank you. I got a copy of the contracts. This seems to be rather unprecedented to get to a contract award stage and have a whole new proposal put on the table uh, that removes uh, the option for uh, all of the applicants. Uh, so I'm going to turn now to the other directors who are in the queue, Director Ames, Foley, and Salzman. Yeah, um, I guess that's a lot of information, but um, I am open to this motion, but I, I guess I have some questions with the IG, possibly, and the staff. But essentially, can you just um, let me know about the, the volume of claims that we're getting now and you had mentioned, because we, we had a briefing yesterday, so the claims have risen over time, and now they're roughly at 1,000 claims per year. Is that 1,000 individual employees, or is there multiple claims per employee? That's another question. It, it can be both. So, oh. Employees can file multiple claims. Okay. So how has it risen over, like, say, I, we didn't go into detail, but do you know offhand how much are, have the claims risen up? I do not know the, the number, but I do see the trend that it is increasing over time. Uh, one thing I would say is that, you know, we, I don't have control over <clears throat> how many claims are filed. Every employee has an opportunity to bring a claim forward whenever they feel that whatever their condition or illness is related to work, and that each claim is vetted and evaluated thoroughly by Athens for whether it meets the standard of a claim, and then it's reviewed and a claim determination is made. So. You know, anybody can file a claim or as many claims as they want, and then we evaluate each one and process each one through a process. Okay, and then as far as the trend going up, how how much, like say five years ago, do you know what the claims were? You, you did talk about it's increasing over time, so I just didn't know what the data was behind that comment. I, I don't have that in front of me right now, but I could provide that if, if you want that. Okay, so I thought it was a significant increase I thought you had mentioned. Anyway, uh, okay, so we don't have that information. Uh, <clears throat> I guess my concern, or I guess I'm, I'm happy to hear that the IG is looking into this and uh, could come up with some recommendations. So not knowing what those would be yet, I can imagine there could be recommendations like, let's improve worker safety, let's try to reduce the claims. Uh, maybe there's something that's related to um, 
you know, how we do our safety program and such. And so we're trying to get it, like we had talked about, we're trying to reduce the number of incidents, reduce, improve the safety and reduce the claims. Because apparently, Director Allen is saying statewide, I guess it's the, what did you say, it was the California WCIRB. Em Employees Rating System? Is that? WCIRB. WCIRB, I don't know. Um, that the, uh, the claims are dropping. So over, right now, I mean, they're kind of tr trending down, but ours are trending up. So to me, it tells me we have safety potential issues with our employees and maybe we need to do more training. Uh, but then also, it does look like we have a, an administrative problem where you only have three staff. And how would you handle uh, more scrutiny on the claims and quick turnaround as John Arantes had mentioned? Mr. Arantes had mentioned it's a little slow. And how could we expedite the processing of the claims, in your opinion, with this contract? Director Ames, I'd, I'd just like to jump in. None of, none of those questions have anything to do with the motion that's on the table. The motion that's on the table is to continue workers' compensation coverage for our employees. Uh, if we do not, if the board does not take an action, that contract will expire and we will not be able to provide those. If the board would like a more detailed update on the workers' compensation program in con conjunction with the uh, Inspector General, happy to do that. But right now here, we're asking for the board to approve the recommendation that's on the table. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. And I, I would expire. like to move this uh, committee meeting along. I just wanted to know when the contract expired, please. I mean, when it expires? Yes. The current contracts expire at the end of this month, and so May 1st would be the beginning of the new contract. We did an extension through a board action um, last fall to extend six months, and that granted us the extension. Thank you for clarifying that. When I asked you for the contracts, you did not send me a copy of that extension. You just sent me the contracts. So that is my, my previous comment that they expired in October was based on what you sent. Director Allen, I'm sorry, I haven't recognized you on this one. And I want to remind all the directors that there have been multiple opportunities to uh, meet with staff and discuss these items before the board meeting. Uh, I'm going to turn to Director Foley. Thank you, Chair Rayburn. Um, I am supportive of staff's original request for this particular contract. Um, that said, I do want to bring this up now, and I'll bring it up as an RCI, but I would like to see on our future uh, QPRs under employee safety some sort of metric to track the time of claims processing and something around, um, you know, bringing something back to the board, uh, maybe periodically, and just update of how the workers' comp program is working. Thank you. Ha happy to do that, Director Foley. Thank you very much. And Director Salzman. Thank you. Um, I think it's important that we move forward today to award this contract. Uh, I would feel very uncomfortable going with the substitute motion for one year because everybody who, who you know, bid on this contract assumed at minimum three years, and that is the level of work they put in. I mean, we know that when companies go out for a contract, they are putting an immense amount of work. And so to say you put in the amount of work, assuming the reward could be a three-year contract, now you're only getting a one-year contract and we're gonna do this process all over, I just don't think that's right to do, um, unless there's some real extenuating circumstances. Um, so I will uh, put forward a substitute motion, which is just the, the motion that's in the EDD. Thank you. And Sorry, isn't there a second? Well, my understanding is we simply vote on the substitute, and if we defeat the substitute... Well, well I need a second. I don't yes. believe we have a or motion on the floor. That's correct. Director Allen's motion was the first motion yes. made. It hasn't been seconded. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Oh, I'll second. And so you... <laughs> now, it is, now it is seconded. It's now seconded. Well, now it's seconded. I it consider seconding. I guess it wasn't clear. I apologize. So seconded, and now I'm making a substitute motion, which is the original, which is in the EDD, um, to award the contract. Thank you for the clarification, General Counsel. And the Vice President seconded that. I have a motion and a second. Let's call the roll. We'll be calling the vote on the substitute motion brought by Director Saltzman and seconded by Vice President Foley. Director Ames. Uh, no. 
Vice President Foley. Aye. Director Lee. I have a point of order. Um, am I allowed to pass and return or is that not allowed under BART board rules? You can abstain from the vote. Okay, yes, I'm going to abstain. Point. Yeah, it's different. Sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, would you mind clarifying the qu question? I, I um, since, so just to offer, uh, in certain bodies you can pass, which simply means that they go and call the roll for the other members and then come back at the end. Oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood. Um, I think that's fine. Yes. That sounds very So you can pass. Yes, I'd like to pass. Okay, we'll come back. Director Rayburn. Yay. Director Saltzman. Yes. Director Simon. Yes. Director Allen. No. Director Lee. Can you read off the vote count right now? I think I got it. Um, yes, we have directors Allen and Ames with current vote of no, and directors Foley, Rayburn, Saltzman, and Simon with a vote of yes, and we have yet to reach okay. President Dufty. Okay, I'm going to abstain. Thank you. President Dufty? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries with directors Allen and Ames voting no and Director Lee um, abstaining. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I just want to thank the Deputy General Manager for his remarks indicating uh, a willingness to work with the Inspector General, and I'm certain that that uh, scope will come back to us so we understand that that uh, is, is possible and taking place. And so I think that's very significant. I appreciate what uh, Vice President Foley has suggested, and, and I think there is broad interest on the board to make sure we have the best program possible and make responsible financial decisions related to it. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, and thank you, staff, for your work in pre preparing a diligent prep, uh, response to my request that you provide a full presentation. You did. Next, we'll discuss the uh, budget, preliminary budget memo for fiscal year 25 and fiscal year 26. Thank you, Director Rayburn. While Chris Simi gets settled in up here and the presentation Welcome, comes up, I'll just introduce the item. So today's informational presentation on the FY25 and FY26 budget kicks off a series of budget discussions that we will have with the board over the next five meetings. Today, we're going to recap the preliminary budget memo that we emailed to you on March 29th and also posted on BART.gov for the public that same day. This presentation follows on the heels of budget discussions at board workshops in last October in this past February, where the board was very supportive of our efforts to continue to deliver high quality service, improve the rider experience, and also focus on extending our fiscal runway and maintaining our capital commitments. So with that, I will turn this over to Chris Simi, Bart's budget director, to walk us through today's presentation. Thanks, Pam. And uh, good morning, directors. Christopher Simi, budget director here. I'll be taking you through a number of slides today that cover our preliminary uh, budget. There's a lot of information, and let me just jump to the agenda there. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of information and many numbers in this presentation, so I'm going to keep it fairly high level, but I do encourage you to refer to the preliminary budget memo for additional information or detail. And I'm, of course, happy to dive deeper on any questions you may have after this presentation. So we'll begin with the current, or FY24, year-end estimate, then move on to the next two years. We'll conclude with a brief preview of the capital budget, which will be covered in much more detail at the next meeting, and then wrap up. So we don't have many updates here on the FY24, uh, on FY24 since our second quarter financial report, which we presented about a month ago. We're still waiting on the March close before we can bring the third quarter report to you. So the expense projection hasn't changed since then. However, sources have changed a little bit and are projected to be slightly lower by the end of FY24. We now project to need about 20 million less in emergency assistance uh, by year end than we budgeted about a year ago. And so this slide is really just about showing a link to where you can access our preliminary budget memo online should you want more information, because everything you see in this presentation comes out of that document, which is, again, much more detailed than this presentation. 
This, uh, this chart here updates the last set of five-year projections you saw back in February at the board workshop. The basic imbalance between our revenues and expenditures isn't changing, as you can see. As before, we can balance next fiscal year, FY25, but are showing a deficit in FY26 of $26 million, so 20, 26 and 26. This is $10 million worse than in February, but it's a gap we can close on our own. Unfortunately, the really big problems begin in FY27. Even with a successful funding measure in November 2026, which we anticipate would begin flowing in FY28, we would need to deal with a $349 million deficit in FY27. And while we could, um, we could cobble something together to get through that one year, mostly with deferrals and one-time solutions, which we've talked to you guys about before, None of those would then be available to us in FY28 and beyond should the measure not be successful. So those years are the really risky ones for BART. We don't have a way to continue service in any acceptable fashion without a permanent operating revenue source. Today, however, uh, we're focusing on the upcoming two years. While the out-year forecast is quite sobering, it's not new, we all know this. Um, and for the next two years, BART is focused on putting out the best service possible and winning over as many riders as we can. This here is a slightly more detailed summary slide, just showing, uh, just focusing on FY25 and FY26. The way this presentation's charts are structured is that we show the FY24 adopted budget in the first column, followed by the FY24 year end estimate. Those columns are followed by the FY25 and FY26 preliminary numbers, as well as dollar and percent changes. I'll note here that we are showing changes between the FY24 year end estimate, the FY24 projected column, excuse me, and FY25 rather than from the FY24 adopted budget. As you know, over the course of this year, our spending, particularly labor, has diverged significantly from budget, so it's more helpful to measure where we think we will end this year against next. And you'll see this set up uh, throughout the presentation. This is a summary slide, so I'll just point to the bolded lines there, uh, which show our projected deficits before emergency assistance is applied. It is a downward trend, I'll note. We anticipate smaller deficits each year from 330 to 326 next year to uh, 309 in FY26. Unfortunately, they're not coming down quickly enough for us. One of the big movers there is ridership, which we'll look at on the following slide. The graphic on the left of this slide shows total trips by month back to FY21 with actuals in blue and preliminary budget assumptions in orange. While ridership increased throughout this period, the rate of increase has progressively slowed. In our budget projections, the slowing growth trend continues. These projections do include some continued improvement in transit mode share, but we are not counting on further return to office as a significant driver of growth. Ridership in FY24 is about 1% below budget through the end of March, and we project just over 50 million trips, uh, 50 million total trips, which you can see on the bottom right there, by year end. The budget includes a total of 53.3 million and 56.5 million trips in FY25 and 26, respectively. Now, looking to operating revenue, um, for FY24 year end, we expect total operating revenue to be slightly better than budget, driven by favorable other non-operating revenue. Specifically, that is investment income, which has been um, very favorable to budget due to high interest rates. Fares and parking revenue are driven by the ridership assumptions as discussed on the prior slide, as well as adopted fare policy. Other operating revenue includes BART Treasury's projections of investment revenue, as well as expected revenue related to commercial communications, advertising, TOD, and other smaller line items. Overall, the budget includes a 10% increase in operating revenue in FY25 and a further 7% increase in FY26. Moving on to financial assistance. For FY24 year end, we expect this revenue to be more than $30 million above budget driven by favorable state transit assistance revenue, which we've been discussing over the course of this fiscal year with you guys. Sales tax is, of course, our largest source of regular revenue. And factoring in ongoing economic uncertainty, the budget assumes a pretty modest 2% increase in sales tax revenue next year. 
Property tax expectations are driven by county forecasts. We assume a 5% increase next year and a 2% increase the year after. We expect state funding programs, including STA, which I was mentioning earlier, to pull back somewhat from this year's levels. Overall, the budget projections assume uh, that financial assistance is roughly unchanged from FY24 to FY25 and then increases 2% by FY26. This chart highlights the change in our revenue structure since before COVID. And I'll note that there's a new color there. It's that sort of light green you see in FY25 and FY26. And that represents the SB25 and regional assistance funding we anticipate. Not all of that has been allocated yet, but that's sort of our current um, understanding of what we, will be, what we will be allocated. We're going to move on to expense now. And of course, as always, we'll be starting with our labor budget. There is a, uh, there's a lot going on here, uh, but the basic structure is that the first section of this table, you know, the first set of rows, shows our gross wages and benefits. Everything we pay out to operating capital and reimbursable staff. The three negative lines beneath that are what we expect to be reimbursed, which leads to a net on that very bottom line there, um, and that's really our operating labor budget. As you know, we have seen a lot of variance here in FY24, primarily due to positions that should have been on the operating instead of capital budget. You will recall we've discussed this issue as part of our two previous quarterly financial reports. And you can see the corrections we've made here. So wages increase, um, mostly that's though because of our sort of our negotiated wage increases that take effect on July 1. However, you'll see that reimbursed wages dropped from 128.7 in the adopted budget down to 96.4 million in FY25. And that is basically the capital positions moving over to the operating budget. The net of these moves is that the operating labor budget increases significantly in FY25. And I do wanna note another large cost driver here um, is that FY25 is the first year we need to be we need to begin making up CalPERS's FY22 market losses, which, as you may recall, were substantial. So when CalPERS doesn't make its investment return targets, member agencies need to make up those lo that loss, I should say, uh, which is amortized over 20 years. Looking now at positions, I'll just, I'll draw your attention to the line title maintenance funding conversions, uh, sort of towards the top of the table there, I think the, the fourth row to the tune of 186 FTEs. These are the positions shifted from capital to operating. As a reminder, these are mostly filled positions, uh, initially brought on with the expectation that they'd be doing capital work. However, they have been doing operating funded work and we expect them to continue to primarily be doing operating funded work going forward. So this change really reflects what's actually going on. We do hope that over the coming year or so, we can shift some of these employees' hours over to capital work wherever possible to reduce the impact to the operating budget. But this is sort of where we think it's going to, going to shake out right now. The remainder of the changes you see here are generally technical or marginal changes, as well as a right-sizing of transportation's FTE count, which was partially offset by vacancy eliminations. Looking at non-labor, um, there are, again, a lot of numbers to digest on this slide. Um, the most important ones are called out in the bullets below. And you can see that two areas of concern are traction power, transmission, and distribution rates, which the state PUC has allowed pg e to increase, while our paratransit costs have also been higher in the current year, uh, a trend which we expect to continue in FY25. There are also a few one-time costs in the budget, notably for the C2 transition and the November election. Our final expense slide uh, shows debt service and allocations. And this is where the largest costs came out of the FY25 and FY26 preliminary budget. You will see that the priority capital line is reduced to zero in both years. And I'd like to provide a bit of context on this. As you know, this allocation funds our core capacity project. We're not making any cuts to that project. We did take a look at cash flow needs, and in FY25 and FY26, there is no need for the 30 to $40 million a year in BART operating funds we had previously assumed would be needed. The project still needs these funds, just not in the next two fiscal years. So this is why we refer to this as a deferral and not a cut. The, uh, the silver lining, of course, is that it does push off a total of $74 million of operating dollar commitments over two years during a particularly critical time for BART's operating budget. 
Now this, the projected fiscal runway, this is a familiar graphic and, and you know, what we really like about it is that it sort of sums up all of the information we've covered in uh, one, one picture, basically. Um, and so as you can see in the college there, we now project to fully exhaust our emergency funding around April 2026, which is close to the end of FY26. And this is probably a good moment to say that we do intend to push that date out as far as we can without sacrificing service. Staff continue to pursue the cost-saving ideas that we discussed at the October 2023 BART Board Budget Workshop, as well as some others. Though we were fortunate then to receive generous assistance from SB 125 and our regional funding partners, we must continue to consider future actions, which may include additional BART-generated revenue, more capital deferrals or actual cuts, land sales, the restructuring of retiree medical and or uh, debt service liabilities, or seeking additional contributions to offset BART's operating shortfall in San Mateo County. And I'll say that each option I just listed is, I know it's a bit of a laundry list, but these are all uh, preferable to scaling back service. Okay, so that sort of finishes up the operating portion of today's presentation. Uh, we have two slides here for FY25 and FY26 on the preliminary capital budget. Um, and you can see FY25 here and FY26. I'm not gonna spend time on them today. Uh, and that's sort of because as you can see here on the timeline, we do have a full presentation on the capital budget uh, coming to you guys in, in I think two weeks. So the next board meeting, I should say. So following that, expect our traditional rail service plan and sources and uses presentation on May 9th, followed by a public hearing and then a vote on adopting the budget. So with that, um, I just wanna say thank you for your time today. And I would be remiss not to thank all of the folks here at BART who've uh, contributed to putting the preliminary budget together. Um, obviously the budget team did uh, the heaviest lifting, um, but I also wanna just acknowledge the assistance we had from all of uh, performance and, and budget under PAM here. Uh, the various ops chiefs, infrastructure delivery, PND, communications, administration, and especially the controller treasurer for, for pulling all this together. And then just a special shout out to our funding strategies team who have been doing just a lot of work over the past few years to incorporate more and improved capital information into this document. So with that, we're happy to take um, questions and discussion. Thank you, Pam and Chris, for your diligent efforts on preparing a very uh, good presentation uh, during these trying times. Before we go to board comments, I'll take public comments. Yes, we do have a speaker in the audience. Uh, Glenn Overton, please. Glenn Overton? Yes. I, nick <clears throat> I nickname myself JQP, Committee of One. Thanks for your due dil diligence. Thank you. I don't see any other in-person speakers and there are no hands raised on Zoom. I'll turn to President Dufty first. Thank you. Um, Chris, I think you might have heard some of the discussion about the paratransit contract and that there's going to be this implementation of something that's much more dynamic. I mean, when you think about um, someone booking a trip and canceling it and that the, that the vehicle is still going by to stop there, it seems like there's a lot of room to grow from the standpoint of cost efficiency. So um, given your, your place in, in, in budget and Pam with also the performance side, it would seem like this might be something good to kind of have the performance shop, like look at it and see if we can get some financial benefit from it. As a lay person, I'm offering yeah, that. Thank you, very good suggestion. Thank you. Good. And I'll follow up with our uh, East Bay Paratransit group as well. Thank you. Director Ames, followed by Director Salzman. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I guess my main concern is taking capital FTEs and moving it over back to, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. It's my mask, my cold, okay. Um, maybe we can go to slide 11, please. And so we're reducing, we're, we're changing our FTEs from capital to 
operating, which uh, apparently is needed right now because we do have um, breakdowns as, and such. And so I, I don't understand why we can't increase the capital projects and the level of effort by hiring outside contractors or whatever we need to do. Because my opinion is if we're shifting capital resources to operating, it tells me that we need, we need somebody to do the capital work. And I don't want to push it out to outer years. I'd like to see a more robust rail replacement, the big, just the big easier projects, which is rail replacement, um, transformer replacements. These are projects that I guess staff is working on, which I really appreciate the, the workforce here is doing rail replacement. But I'd like to see contractors also double up on this. So I know that the team, this is a CIP discussion, so I'm not gonna go into depth because, um, but I would like to see a robust capital program that we could continue on and not shift so much of the workforce over to ops. So I hope that's clear. Um, and then you did mention about our, I think it was our operating revenues is benefiting from investments. Can you can you go over that slide and that that concept, please? Yeah, uh, sure, sure, director. So uh, basically, you know, Bart Bart has significant sort of cash holdings, and they're invested. Uh, and this is more, of course, uh, Chris Gant's world, but basically, they're they're invested in a variety of sort of uh, very safe securities. And with the higher interest rates that we're seeing, right. you know, uh, basically from from the Federal Reserve, they are they are spending off more interest income than, than we had anticipated at the beginning of the fiscal year. And this interest income is from the bond issuance that we've done in the past, and we're not particularly using all of the funds from the bond issuance, is that correct? The interest income that's reported under the general fund or operating fund um, comes from money available from the general fund. It doesn't come from the bond fund. Those are trucked separately. So the general fund, though, is, you know, we're in trouble. So I don't know how we're making money on our general fund the, the investments. General, the, the, the general fund, whole, um, we have an operating fund and our, our reserve fund. Uh, so the combination of those two and, and the timing of when cash is received. So any available money that we have on hand, we invest those uh, sufficiently as possible. And that's how we get this interest income. Okay, I guess possibly we could do this at another meeting, but I do want to look at our reserves. I don't think our reserves are high enough. And this is a whole reserve study analysis that I'd like to see the staff come back with. I don't think the reserves are high enough, and I know we have to we, we can do some investments, but yeah. is it possible that we could look at take a closer look at our reserves? In addition, uh, Director, I just want to point out also that uh, because of the emergency relief grants, we're, in, we're able to take the money uh, earlier than when we actually used it. Uh, and those are all sitting in our reserve fund. So that's a big chunk of cash that we have on hand. That we, yeah. Okay, that may, okay, thank you for clarifying that. I would like to look at our reserves a little more closely. Is that possible to do at the next meeting? Director Ames, when we come back to you with the quarterly financial report, actually, let me rephrase that. Okay. Every quarterly financial report has a page that summarizes our reserve holdings. Okay. And so when we're back to see you with the third quarter results in May, uh, that will include a refreshed look at BART's reserve holdings. It would be good to not only look at the refresh, but like study what our reserves should be, because I think we should be a little higher than what we're proposing right now, but that's a whole other conversation. I, actually, I just also want to add that the board adopted um, a financial stability policy a number of years ago, and gosh, right before the pandemic, updated the reserve uh, policy segment of that financial stability policy. Right, but now we're in a little bit of a, before, that was before the pandemic. So anyway, I'm just thinking our reserves should, should be more, should be enhanced. Um, Thank you. You had asked a question uh, or implied a question. Uh, I'll follow up with Pam and Chris to address the 106 maintenance funded 
conversions and the cost that, or the savings that was included in that? Uh, so it was 186, uh, not 106, um, but it, it's the cost is about $32 million is the full, you know, wages fringe um, benefit costs for those positions. Thank you very much. Okay, so just the big picture for me, I just wanted to finalize my comments, please. Is it? And Please wrap up. Thank you. Um, so, the, okay, can you explain again the reason that we're moving the capital FTE to operating, and I'd like to know what this FTE is working on right now. I mean, can we get can we get that information? Like the projects they're working on. Uh, so, so director, I'll start with the first part and then get to the second part of your question there. So. What happened is we, over the course of several years, we brought on, you know, as, as you know, we have positions that are budgeted to do operating focused work, right? So a great example is a police officer or a train operator, right? And then we have positions that are budgeted to do capital work. And, and good examples of those are usually like engineers, project managers, those type of positions who are, who are working on, on you know, various either reinvestment or uh, projects like that, building substations, those type of things. Um, these, what turned out was going on is we had a number of positions who have been brought on um, that sort of uh, don't fit in either of those buckets. And those are sort of really think of, of uh, trades type positions, right? So electricians, um, structures, equipment operators, welders, those type of, of folks, and they have, their skill set can either be used to sort of do uh, work that is considered operating, but they can also use their, their um, we can sort of assign their hours to do capital work, right, as we, because we do deliver a number of our own capital projects as, as we were discussing earlier. And so these positions over time, um, and the positions we're discussing are mostly those sort of, you know, quote unquote, wrench turners there. Um, they have been increasingly drawn into doing work that is that is operating. And so they have been doing that for, for some time now. We've been sort of working on this over, over a while. And what we're trying to do through the budget here is merely to sort of correct that and reflect that in the budget so that, it, so that it's clear. And, and as you've seen in our last few quarterly financial reports, it's sort of thrown things off a bunch with respect to our capital reimbursements and our wages. Um, and so the big, the big sort of sort of under the hood, if you will, goal here uh, for, for us was really to to sort of reflect those positions correctly. So even though there's a lot moving in the budget, right, there's there's no there's no real sort of change in terms of what they're actually what they're actually doing. You know, going forward, uh, we mentioned I think about a month ago that Shane and Sylvia are working on finding ways to kind of get those folks to do some more capital work wherever possible. But um, the priority sort of needs to be on on really maintaining the reliability of of the railroad, and, and that's sort of what they've been what they've been doing, and will likely continue to be doing. Okay, I I do think we have a reliability problem, and this is why I want to push for more capital work and FTEs towards capital, not not to this extent, but maybe maybe we we use private sector, and the private sector can do the capital work. Obviously, we need some FTEs to manage those contracts. But I would like to double up on capital and operating uh, work in the system because, you know, we have this, this is a historic budget, I guess I would say, um, because we do need to show the public we need to be more reliable, more efficient, and we can't have these breakdowns as we know. I know we're trying, and I appreciate operations trying to come to the rescue uh, to, to help our riders get to where they need to go and, start, and not have these breakdowns midstream. So please, let's, I guess this is a capital discussion combined with operating at the next meeting that I'm going to be pushing for. Yeah, and, and I, I just uh, want to add quickly, I would be remiss if I didn't say that it's, these, these positions are not doing operating work because there's not capital work. There is plenty of capital work for them to be doing. It's just that they have been doing operating work. I just wanted to clarify okay. that. Thank you. Thank you, and I know we've had similar discussions and I appreciate your preparation and elaboration in the boardroom. Uh, Director Salzman. Thank you. Um, first, I want to thank staff for the very readable preliminary budget report. I always think it's one of the best comprehensive documents we have every year. 
um, and especially liked the photos this year in it featuring BART next to stop traffic on various freeways um, because it really shows why, why we are so important. Um, I asked a lot of questions during my briefing, so I won't re-ask those, but I, I just wanted to make a couple of points, which is mostly about not this current budget year coming up, but the next one in the following years, which is, I think it's important that we do as much as we can do to close the fiscal year 26 deficit ahead of time. Um, that doesn't mean we approve this budget and there's no deficit, but especially thinking about the fact that, you know, at least there are gonna be at least four new board members coming on. This will be their first budget process. I think it's really important not to kind of punt this situation. And if we can if we can come up with any ongoing savings, even if they're small, if it's, you know, three million, that's not just a three million impact on next year. It's a six million dollar impact on next year. So I think we need to look for every opportunity not to do big things that would really detriment our riders like slashing service, but looking at the margins. And I know you've all already been doing this, but I, I think we need to do more of that. Um, so I hope as you come back, and I know you're always refining the projections and all sorts of things as we go through the couple of months, but I think it's very important to try to find savings ideally ongoing, but even one time where we can so that we can help out with next year and the following years. And then the other thing, which I don't think we need to have this discussion today, but I'd like us to have a discussion, whether it's through this budget process or later this year, about fiscal year 27 and the various kind of options. Because either way, even if a measure passes, it's the money's not going to be there immediately. And so talking about what are our plans, how we get through that with whether it's one-time funds or outside funds or what we're doing. And then I think it's important to start communicating more concretely about if the measure doesn't passes, what does that mean for fiscal year 27 or at the least fiscal year 28? Maybe there aren't even enough, there won't even be enough time if, if, to know what cuts to make for FY27. But I think it's not too early to start having those discussions. Obviously, we don't, the future could be totally different, but we're not far out from that. So I'd like to see us have that discussion. So I don't know, Bob, Michael, Pam, if you could talk to, like, have you thought about bringing back these discussions later this year and, and where we're planning for the future? Thank you. You bring up a very important part. You know, two years from now, we'll be sitting down and, and, you know, staring at this fiscal cliff as we put together the budget for FY27. That is our gap year. That is the year that we need to solve. And unfortunately, when we sit here two years from now, we're going to still be six or seven months before an election. We won't know. So, yes, uh, we're, there's a lot of internal strategizing going on right now. You know, if we knew for certain at that time that we were trying to just cover one year of 300 million or so, I think that we could come up with some solutions to make that work. The problem is we won't know at this time. So that's what we're working on right now. And I appreciate that, that you've asked for some additional discussion. So, you know, yeah. happy to coordinate with the GM. And Director Salzman, the, um, you know, it is something that I've been given a lot of thought to. You're going to hear after this, um, you know, Rod's going to be up here with Amanda on 1031 and, you know, some of the amendments that are, um, we're trying to navigate with the operators and MTC and, you know, um, thinking through the, you know, the variations that are possible there, you know, if you play a game, you know, what happens with 1031 if it goes this way, then what happens if it doesn't go this way, then, you know, and so we are starting to, I mean, I already am. Um, I was with, you know, on the phone call with MTC, you know, yesterday about, um, you know, some what ifs. And so it's, it's, uh, it's keeping me up at night a little bit lately. So anyway, we, it doesn't go unnoticed um, that we need to be thinking about this. Well, I just remember that we're a team here and it shouldn't just be keeping you up at night. So share the responsibility here and maybe we can have a discussion and, and know that you're not the only one. Yes, ma'am. And I appreciate your, your uh, support there. I have always and I always will. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Director Salzman, and thank you, General Manager, for your responses. And 
I will just state that I'm really pleased to see that despite the looming uh, operating deficits, uh, that the, the actions are being taken to make uh, every possible savings uh, in this agency while we continue to deliver uh, exceptional service. And I was pleased to hear that we will guard service levels. That doesn't mean we will expand service levels. There may not be the funding for such uh, actions. Uh, so I'm, I'm not optimistic that I'll see some 10-car uh, trains uh, in the May 9th uh, rail service plan. Uh, but I am pleased to see the deferrals, not cuts, for things like the core capacity that result in some near-term savings for the agency. Uh, while we're working diligently to restore the public uh, trust and ridership levels in, at BART. So uh, I think that we're, we're on the right track in, in dealing with the issues. I personally sleep at night and then get up and then I am, show my concern and address the issues so that I can do them while I'm fully uh, awake. So. With that said, we'll close. Director Rayburn, excuse Yes, me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I, I, I thought I was in see, the queue. But I, I, I was out of the your... queue and then I'm back in the queue. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Do you mind if I do have a few comments? It's not long. Would you please keep it short? <laughs> okay. So um, first of all, I'm, I'm, I, am, uh, I am encouraged to hear us um, begin to have the conversation um, about plan B, um, you know, of uh, different options of what will happen in the next few years and, and we should be uh, planning for that. And thank you, Bob, I'm glad you are, I know you are. Um, I, uh, I'm just wondering, service levels, are we going to have that convers, this, this budget assumes continued the same service levels, correct? Correct. It continues the same service. It nothing assumes more. the same service we are we are running, and nothing we have more, nothing less. Right, and we'll have some more details on that uh, in in May at the rail service plan. Okay, um, on the on the reimbursement from the capital budget and the reasons why we're fifty million over budget on the operating labor. You know, you and I have discussed this. I don't necessarily agree that it's okay to say that we didn't need that labor in capital, so we overspent on the operating side by $50 million. Um, what that means to me is that, you know, we, at best, we didn't do a good job of planning, but um, I, I'm not sure how we overspend operating by $50 million. Um, without having planned to do that. Um, so I, that that's still a point of contention for me. I know we've gone over that before. You don't need to go over it again. Um, the elimination of the capital allocations, that does concern me. Um, back in 2016, when Measure RR was passed, there was considerable discussion in my county, in Contra Costa, with community leaders, um, with our former general manager, uh, talking about the maintenance of efforts, that's what it was called, maintenance of effort to continue to move certain amounts of, of operating budget to fund the capital projects. And I understand what you say when we don't, when you say, well, we don't need that in the next two years, but that would be 56 million over two years, right? 28 each year. Is that what we deferred? Uh, 74. 74 yeah, they're higher costs in 25 okay. and 26. Okay, so then in, in, in two years, three years from now, um, we're 74 million less in funding than we should have had if we had continued to fund the capital budget. And so how, then I, what I'm afraid of is we get two years down the road and then we're going, well, we don't have enough money to actually move that project forward as quickly as we had thought. So, Director Allen, just to be clear, um, we did not eliminate the capital allocations. It is a deferral to better match the timing and of the project needs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, budgeting best practice would have us not tie up large chunks of funds and not put them to good use uh, during, you know, especially at a time like this when we're challenged with other funding sources. Um, I was, 
Um, so I just want to be really clear, we are not eliminating the capital allocations. It's deferral to better match the timing of the project needs. And I think, you know, over the years that I've managed the budget process, I've always been very clear with the board, with Contra Costa County, and with people that are listening, that capital allocations is a financial management tool for the district. When times are good, we bump up the allocation, and when times are bad, and I've been through a few of these times mm -hmm. uh, with the agency, we reduce the capital allocation. So we're not trying to jeopardize the capital program, we are simply aligning the allocations with the timing of the project needs. Okay, and I was just looking, as we move out, I'm, I'm looking at the five-year outlook. Um, I'm not seeing an extra $74 million in those later years. And so, I, I, again, I fear we get to this point, we can talk about this later, we get to this point in three years from now and we're all going, but we don't have enough capital. We already know that we're something like $8 billion unfunded currently over the next 10 years, and I know you're gonna talk about that more at the next meeting. Um, so I, I guess maybe we can defer this to the next meeting given that uh, um, some people wanna move on. Um, so I also know that this, this budget includes continued uh, zero allocations to the pension trust, is that correct? That's correct. So we're no, you know, this board actually agreed a few years back to get to put $10 million of operating money into the Section 115 pension trust to begin to pay down the unfunded liabilities. Those liabilities continue to grow, and I think we see that in the labor budget where the pension cost goes way up in two years from now. Um, so that problem is, is going to continue to get worse um, with respect to growing unfunded liabilities. Um, and then I, let's see, I guess, um, you know, without going into a lot of detail of slide 10 on the labor, can we just get a breakdown um, of the labor costs by BART, by BART department? so that we can see, and, and maybe the budgeted versus prior year actual by department. Um, because I wanna see that, you know, how much labor cost is going up in the maintenance department, how much is going up in operations, and so forth. I, absolutely, yeah. There is um, one of the, I think, I forget which attachment, in, in the preliminary budget memo, towards the end there, after all the capital projects, it shows each, um, each executive office their total labor and non-labor budget, as well as their, their Is that in counts. dollars? It's in dollars and positions. Sorry, yeah. I haven't gotten that far in that document. Yeah, it's and if you have you know, questions, feel free to reach out and we can provide yeah. additional information. Good, good to know. Um, and I think, you know, that that is it. I have one last comment, really. You know, in the last item where I was really stopped short um, uh, and, and comments were cut short, um, and, and a comment was made here at the dais that to request a, you know, make a request as I was doing to sort of stop and pause on awarding a contract when we have some problems that we need to work through and, and should we be awarding a five-year contract. Um, and the comment that was made is that, that that is unprecedented that we would we would stop this at the dais. And I'm sorry, but it, it, if it is unprecedented, well, it's going to become a precedent this year because that's a true cost that we are spending that is really getting higher and higher and we need to address. And if we're really, really serious about bringing this budget in line, and I appreciate the comments of Director Saltzman about taking hard looks at where we can start to manage costs better, and that was one of them in that last item. Uh, and I'm, I'm really kind of um, puzzled as to why suddenly uh, that was unprecedented. So um, that I hope that that's not, not how, and I'm talking, item. so I didn't interrupt you, why don't you not interrupt me, okay? So I hope that we can move forward and have really thoughtful discussion about these cost issues. I know they're hard, and I know it's hard to look at cutting costs, but I think that the public who is going to vote on the next tax measure is really going to appreciate that thoughtful work. Thank you. Okay, I try my best to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to speak. And as I was making my concluding remarks, uh, Director Allen, 
put herself in the queue. So uh, that was something that sort of changed the dynamics. And I'm reminded by the president that we have a very robust closed session uh, and the PAL, PPAL committee yet to address. So I feel that we should be moving along in a much better fashion than we have been. And please, if you have comments, get in the queue early. You will be recognized. You will have opportunities to speak. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation and for the comments. And now we will move to um, we do not have any engineering and operation items today, so we will move to um, item 10, PPAL, and Director Rayburn will be chairing this as the chair of, uh, of PPAL. Thank you, President Dufty. We have two items. Uh, state legislation, the Senate Bill 1011 from Senators Wiener and Wahab, and the El Cerrito BART Station Transit-Oriented Development. Good morning, Chair Rayburn. Uh, with us uh, this morning on the first item, we have Rod Lee, Assistant General Manager of External Affairs, Amanda Cruz, Director of Government and Community Relations, as well as Alex Walker, our Manager of Government Relations and Legislative Affairs, and we'll go right to Rod. Thanks, Val, and good morning, Chair Rayburn and board members. I just want to refresh um, your memory. It was only two weeks ago, but at your last board meeting, uh, staff, we brought forward Senate Bill 1031 by Senator Weiner and Senator Wahab. Um, your board took a position of support if amended and gave direction for, board, for staff to come back and provide updates uh, on the amendments and how their process is going. So I want to let you know over the last two weeks, uh, there have been uh, consistent uh, communication and discussions in regards to these amendments. Uh, the general manager, as you well know, convenes a weekly GM coordination meeting with all the large operators. Uh, MTC has come into both of those meetings over the last two weeks discussing uh, these amendments with all of the GMs of the large operators, as well as MTC has gone to the small operators uh, and discussed these amendments with them. And then my leg legislative team here, uh, Amanda and Alex, have been daily communication with MTC's legislative staff, as well as uh, legislative staff from all the agencies. So I just want to kind of set that scene, that there's been a lot of collective effort uh, and involvement in regards to these amendments. So we have two um, sets of amendments. Uh, we've got requested amendments on the consolidation uh, language in the bill, as well as we have draft amendments uh, that haven't been submitted to uh, the offices as of, as of yet on MTC's authority. So I want to start off with Alex, and Alex is just going to review some key dates, and then we'll go into the specifics of the amendments that are being sought. Uh, thank you, AGM Lee. So um, first, uh, we will begin with an overview of the staff presentation. Uh, we'll start by looking at key dates for the bill over the next two months and review specific concerns BART hopes to address through multiple rounds of amendments. You will then walk through amendments that have been jointly developed by MTC and transit agency legislative staff in three key areas, consolidation, guardrails on MTC authority, and maintenance of effort language. Finally, we will update the board on positions taken by peer agencies and preview updates for the April 25th board meeting. So here we have listed key legislative dates with future updates to the board in bold. Uh, tomorrow, there is a joint MTC ABAG legislative committee meeting in which commission staff will provide an update on proposed consolidation amendments, guardrails to address operator concerns with enhanced MTC authority, uh, expenditure framework, and return to source provisions. The bill will be heard in the Senate Transportation Committee on April 23rd, and the Senate Revenue and Taxation Committee on April 24th, followed by key legislative deadlines at the end of April and then through May, as you can see on your screen. On this slide, we highlight the areas of concern identified by staff in our initial analysis to the board at the March 28th meeting. Over the last several weeks, we've been working closely with MTC and legislative staff from PR transit agencies on potential amendments to the proposed consolidation assessment and implementation plan, uh, language to address concerns with MTC's uh, enhanced network management authority as well. 
So currently, SB 1031 requires the California State Transportation Commission, or CALSTA, to select an academic institution to report on numerous details about the Bay Area's transit operators and make recommendations of the advantages and disadvantages of consolidating all 27 transit agencies by January of 2026. Following the assessment, CALSTA would be charged with presenting a plan for consolidation to the legislature by the beginning of 2027. The next four slides that we will be going through focus on amendments that have been jointly crafted by MTC and Trans HC staff regarding consolidation. These amendments have been submitted to the bill authors, Senators Wiener and Wahab, for consideration and seek to ensure that the bill does not predetermine consolidation as the preferred outcome. Uh, to simplify current language, be less prescriptive in required information for assessment and implementation plan. To set a realistic time frame for completion of an assessment implementation plan after a ballot measure is approved, and to clarify who shall pay for the assessment and implementation activities. So the following amendments have been submitted to the bill authors, as I mentioned, and, and represent a collaborative effort. Um, amendments retain the requirement of a consolidation assessment and implementation plan, but they clarify that consolidation is not intended to be a merger of all 27 transit agencies. Rather, the definition of consolidation within the bill is revised and expanded to include options that do not modify the governance of transit agencies, such as um, the combining or sharing of staff uh, or resources functionalities as underlined here. Next, we focus on amendments pertaining to the proposed consolidation assessment. First, amendments allow the State Transportation Agency, or CALSTA, to select a consultant team, which may include an academic transportation institute, to conduct the consolidation assessment and require individuals with a specific set of expertise work on the assessment. More importantly, amendments require the assessment to evaluate the potential for enhanced coordination in addition to consolidation to meet specified goals of improved rider outcomes, um, increased transit ridership, increased passenger miles traveled, improved social equity and greater cost efficiencies. And as I'll describe later, further work uh, is needed to more clearly define these goals. Amendments remove the exhaustive list of data collection requirements required for each transportation agency and provide greater clarity that the assessment shall compare consolidation options with anticipated outcomes from current coordination under regional network manager framework and enhanced coordination opportunities. Finally, amendments set a more reasonable due date of the assessment um, to be due 24 months after the passage of the revenue measure. Regarding implementation and funding, the amendment set a due date for the implementation plan to one year after the assessment is completed and shifts the focus away from solely the consolidation of all transit agencies. Amendments further clarify that CALSTA is not empowered to implement governance changes for the region and the exhaustive list of information requirements is deleted. In regarding to funding, the request amendments clarify that the costs of doing the assessment and implementation plan can be covered by this new technical assistance fund created in this legislation and cannot be an unfunded mandate on any of the parties involved. So finally, in this area, there are some outstanding issues that remain in the consolidation language, um, two of which we identify here. The stated goals of the assessment and implementation plan require further definition and potential metrics. Um, it's not yet determined to what extent the revenue industry will pay for consolidation activities. So will the state subsidize some portion of this work or will the region be forced to cover everything? Um, decisions will be informed by cost estimates for a robust assessment and implementation plan and subject to future negotiations. So with that, um, Amanda Cruz will now go through proposed amendments regarding MTC's enhanced network management authority and maintenance of effort language. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. <clears throat> and uh, good morning, directors. You may recall Senate Bill 1031 charges MTC with new responsibilities to create a seamless transit rider experience and allows for the conditioning of new and existing funding on compliance with commission rules and regulations on fair coordination, fair integration, as well as schedules, mapping, and wayfinding. As Alex mentioned, for several weeks, legislative staff have been working with MTC 
on draft amendments to address operator concerns with MTC's Enhanced Network Management Authority. The draft amendments, which MTC and operators refer to as guardrails, seek to maintain agency control over specific functions, including budgets, fund sources, bargaining, brand identity, and service planning. Specifically, the draft amendments prohibit MTC from doing several things. MTC cannot restrict an agency's access to funds not allocated by the commission. MTC cannot require an agency to make a one-time or ongoing expenditure or policy change that is found to have a negative impact on service, staffing, maintenance, or other specified operational considerations. MTC cannot interfere or impede on an agency's right to bargain with transit labor representatives or comply with any legal obligations in existing transit labor contracts. Agencies retain their ability to utilize brands and logos outside the scope of the Commission's regional mapping and wayfinding efforts. And a transit agency cannot be forced to modify a local service route not identified as primarily serving regional transit service. So these draft amendments seek to strike a balance between the desire for MTC to have greater authority to advance regional coordination while setting distinct safeguards to ensure operators maintain a certain level of autonomy. The bill also included a broad maintenance of effort clause which requires agencies that receive ballot measure funding to maintain their existing commitment of local funds and not supplant any sources of operating revenue. Draft amendments seek to clarify the types of local funds a transit agency shall maintain to be eligible for an allocation of funds, as well as provide a method for calculating an agency's maintenance of effort for transit operations. Flexibility is also provided for an agency to reduce the amount of funding contributed to its operating budget if there is a proportional reduction in operating costs or anticipated reduction in operating revenue, such as an expiring voter-approved revenue source. Finally, a transit agency may request the commission grant an exemption to the maintenance of effort requirement for the purposes of transferring operating funds to state of good repair needs. This allows agencies such as BART to continue the practice of allocating operating funds to the capital budget. To wrap up our presentation, we share recent positions taken by peer agencies since March 28th and note tomorrow's meeting of the joint MTC ABAG Legislative Committee where the com committee will be asked to support staff's proposed amendments. In our final slide, we note the topics that we will be covering at your next board meeting on April 25th, which include MTC's proposed uh, funding, framework propo uh, funding framework proposal, their return to source provisions, and the outcome of the two committee hearings that will be happening in, on April 23rd and 24th. And that concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation and all the hard work that went on behind it uh, and the hard work that's ahead of us as well. Let's hear any public comments. Yes, oh, we have Glenn Overton in the audience. Please step up to the microphone. And while Glenn's approaching the microphone, I want to make sure certain that all the directors have an opportunity to weigh in, including Director Lee, who's remote here. I didn't hear from you the last time, so I'll turn to you first, if you wouldn't mind. But Glenn Overton, thank you. Well, I'm, I may be still alive when this gets done, huh? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> But having said that, Success concerns us. The visual issue is uh, here. JQP Committee of One only wants one brand. You can have all the different management types you want. I just want one logo, man, for the whole thing. 
but I mean, you know, also, I already have integrated the system. I just use Google, and Google does the integration for me. But you know, but then you get that problem when you're getting from one thing to the next, you know. But I, 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 I'm happy for you. <laughs> I'm really happy for me, huh? Uh, but anyway, having said that, logo, visual things lo like logos and whatever, consistency means a lot to me. Uh, but uh, how you manage within that. So you set the ball rolling, you know, the uh, evolutionary thing. And once, it's, once the ball is going and you get everybody under this thing, who has the momentum to stop that ball? Thank you. Thank you, Glenn, and you'd be pleased to know the coordination's already underway on many efforts, including those logos uh, between agencies that you'll see in wayfinding signs. Do we have any other public comments? I don't see any other in-person comments, but we do have a couple hands on Zoom. Please go ahead. So we'll go first to Ian. Welcome, Ian. <clears throat> Good morning, uh, Bar board members. This is uh, Ian Griffiths, Policy Director of Seamless Bay Area. Um, and thanks for the staff work uh, and your consideration of this item. I think my overall comment here, um, Seamless is su supporting SB uh, 1031, our, our organization supports it, really calling on the BART board and BART as an organization to be a leader among our transit agencies in, um, in the region in championing uh, a more integrated um, system that um, is enabled through reforms, not only through new funding, but through the institutional reforms that can deliver that integration. Um, you know, you were the first transit agency to adopt the seamless transit principles, which is was really impactful. And I think your work on this bill should really align with those principles. Um, I think this the positions taken by those other transit agencies that have uh, very early come out with these very, you know, these positions of opposed and less amended are, are, you know, really disappointing. Um, there are issues to work through from the initial uh, language proposed in the bill. I think we're supportive of some of the, you know, clarifications in particular uh, around the consolidation language that has been uh, outlined by staff here. But the, the sort of tenor of these guardrails uh, around limiting the scope, you know, all, having all these caveats be part of, you know, concerted effort among transit agencies to sort of limit the scope of potential integration. I think you really need to be careful and engaging in those types of, um, you know, like putting all that much effort into advocating for those things. When we see successful examples of network managers in other regions, they have very broad authority. And uh, they work because there's a successful and collaborative relationship between transit agencies and and the network manager, you know, in this case, MTC. Um, so they don't they don't include carve outs for a million different exceptions of every single instance in which a local agency can do something or choose to disobey the regional standard. So um, I think there's there's too much detail in these proposed amendments in general. And I think BART's role should really be to focus on the big picture of, uh, of, of establishing important processes, making sure the network management structure that's created within MTC has the right representation to represent transit agencies, but also have experts be guiding uh, policy making. There has, I know there's gonna be probably more discussion about what the network management structure is within, within this work. But, uh, but uh, again, thank you for your historic leadership on this topic in the past, and I really just hope that that extends into your advocacy around SB 2030, uh, 1031, and I hope you do adopt a support position ultimately for this bill. Thank you, that is the goal, uh, at least this person's goal. Let's uh, go to the next speaker. Adina. Dina, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, Adina Levin with Seamless Bay Area. I wanted to concur with what my colleague um, Ian has said and to emphasize a different point about the process. 
um, and, um, you know, working to clarify the consolidation language and, um, you know, a, a address some of the concerns about the network management and coordination language is, you know, a, a good thing for agencies to be working together to ensure that needs are met both for effective coordinated service and, um, you know, to, uh, you know, uh, maintain agency budgets and so on. Um, however, I um, wanted to really emphasize what Ian said about uh, BART playing a leadership role um, with peer agencies to um, keep working together on negotiating this bill to be able to achieve an outcome that will allow it to pass and to get a measure on the ballot. The um, uh, uh, fellow agencies that have taken oppose and less positions. Um, uh, you know, my concern is that as of, you know, May 1st and 2nd, when they're coming back, and if there are some amendments that have made progress, but that are delivering, you know, 80% of what transit agencies are seeking, um, that if agencies at that time take an all or nothing position and we're done negotiating, then it's at the outcome of that all or nothing position will be nothing and we will not have regional funding. We will not have a viable uh, coordinated or even discoordinated public transportation system in this region. It's very important to work together to constructively negotiate on this bill to get to a point of agreement so it can pass and get us to a regional measure. Uh, please do work in a collaborative and leadership role with peer agencies so that they stay on this and, uh, you know, don't, you know, give up on May 1st and 2nd um, if it is not 100% of what everyone wants at that point in time. Thank you very much for your leadership in this area. Thank you, Adina. And we have one more hand, the Alita. Alita, please go ahead. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Robert Rayburn and members. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her with Team Folds. Hope you can hear me. I'm broadcasting from the seven line of the New York City subway. Hopefully we'll keep the signal. So um, I'm looking forward to this bill. It's really, really complicated as to what uh, consolidation means and raising revenue means. Uh, I don't have a long history in California as to how we ended up with 27 transit agencies. But we have several here in New York, as I've said before, Denver makes it really easy. But this is going to take time. If you when you when you started a subway in 1904, and you had the dual contracts in 1913, and two systems merged with the city owned system in 1940, then the state took over in 1953, the MTA was formed in 1968. Uh, that's 64 years. So how can we do this here in California in, in a much shorter period of time? And uh, I, can, I see a concern that some board members might lose their jobs and some general managers might lose their jobs. And you go to a Clipper board meeting and you see that really great pool of talent of general managers. And I want to see all of those general managers uh, stay involved in the conversations of running Bay Area uh, transportation. How would you appoint a board uh, of an agency this big, MTA's 12 counties? I think all the board members are appointed by the governor. Uh, 23 of them. It's a, it's a big project. But I maintain to you the importance of consistent funding. Why is that? I'm not speaking academically. If you want to look what, at what transit funding is like, and I've said this before, you take a look at the New York City subway in the 1970s and 1980s and, and the cars, graffiti, and there are broken lights and all kinds of other things. I mean, that, that really happened. Uh, th that's not a myth. There's no denying it. I, I live that and saw it every single day. It took strong leadership to get past that. And now strong leadership has new challenges in New York, uh, such as building accessible subway stations. Um, 
How do we do that here at BART? These are conversations that are going to be really, really hard. And yes, I plan to go to more meetings because I want to hear more about this. Takes. I can't call myself an expert, but I can only share with you my experience. But this I can say that BART needs to be at the table in this. And this is why, because BART is the people's system. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other comments? There are no additional hands raised. Thank you very much. And I want to make sure that I give everyone time to comment. I've already indicated I would like to lead off with Janice Lee. She's been very patient to participate remotely here today. Uh, I will look through the speaker list uh, on my screen or please catch my eye. I'm looking up and down the dais. And I hope to also hear from the general manager here today. Uh, I think he probably has some comments to share. So, Director Lee. Yes, um, thank you, Director Rayburn, for chairing the admin committee. Um, and again, now uh, for the PPAL committee. Um, I. I don't think I have like a lot of comments at this time, but I do have a couple questions for staff. Um, so it seems that the support unless amended position that this BART board took at the March 28th meeting was not really carried forward by others. So while I understand the comments made by Ian and Adina with Seamless Bay Area, the BART board is really only one of the many transit boards taking a position on this bill. As I've not been following this bill for the past few weeks, I'm quite surprised by slide 12 and wonder if staff can provide more information on the opposed unless amended positions that other boards have taken. Also wondering if this SFCTA board has taken a, a position or is expected to. Uh. Yeah, thanks for the question, Director Lee. Um, in our understanding of the positions taken by uh, the three agencies that we had listed on side 12, uh, the majority, the, the bulk of the concerns were related to the consolidation language uh, that was that's in the current bill. And um, those agencies staff have um, been working alongside BART and MTC on the set of um, consolidation amendments. So we hope that that does move the needle in, in, you know, in, in their future consideration of, of their position. Um, that's something that MTC uh, very clearly notes in, in their agenda packet to their legislative committee tomorrow. Um, that the consolidation was the main issue of, of concern. Um, as far as uh, agencies that Alex and I are tracking that um, will are um, scheduled to take positions, I believe the SF Board of Supervisors may be taking a position on, on Tuesday, the, the 16th. Um, and and um, I, I don't know if their position is public yet, so I won't, I won't say that in, in the boardroom. Uh, and then um, Son Sonoma County TA has also uh, her, um, discussed this bill, and I believe they have taken um, an opposed unless amended position as well. Um, we have not heard any indications from peer agencies such as AC Transit that um, they have a firm date for, for taking a position. Got it. Um, and then my second, oh, my second question is really, you know, the state politics of this. Um, I'd like to know more about what we know of how our state legislators are considering this bill, of course, outside the two sponsors. Um, obviously, our state legislators, along with Bay Area voters, will ultimately determine whether a regional transit operations funding bill in 2026 becomes a reality. So my concern is ensuring BART BART board remains collaborative and maintains positive relationships with our state legislators every step of the way as we approach what may come in 2026 and beyond. So I don't know, Amanda, um, Rod, Alex, if you, you can talk about how, how this bill is faring you know, amongst the Bay Area caucus, at state legislators, at expected committees, et cetera. Um, thank you, Director Lee. So what I can say for now is that um, the leadership in the Senate, so we have the new Senate uh, pro tem recently, you know, Senator McGuire, who is from the Bay Area, the North Bay, um, he has put a, um, you know, big emphasis on, you know, finding ways to get this bill 
keep this bill moving. Um, for example, when he combined the efforts of Senator Wiener and Senator Wahab, their two bills are now one. And there's also been um, uh, groups of legislators uh, getting together. I can, I can mention, you know, for example, we know it's going to go through the committees for Senators Cortese and Senators Glazer. They chair the two committees it's going to go to. So there's, they have been, I know, in conversations. And we will continue to work with throughout the region. But we do know that the leadership is making, making a big um, effort to bring people together around this in, in the region. Got it. Um, all right. Well, the only other comment I have then is just to thank Senators Wahab and Wiener for um, really putting a lot of time, energy, and capacity into this bill and really, it seems like really doing everything they can. I mean, it takes a lot of time to work with so many transit operators and across the nine Bay Area counties and their, you know, legislator colleagues, et cetera. So I, I just want to send my thank you to the offices and to the senators themselves, Senators Wahab and Wiener on this. Uh, I'll end my comments there. Thank you. Thank you very much for your potent questions. Uh, Director Salzman. Thank you. Um, I, again, want to thank staff for just like continuously working on this bill all the time and treating it as the priority it is. And, you know, I, I share a lot of the same thoughts as, as Director Lee and to our, you know, our, our colleagues at Seamless. Uh, I appreciate the work you're doing. I hope you do realize, though, as Director Lee says, we are the only ones leading on this at this point. Um, so I, I hope some others will, I, I hope MTC will, but that is why it is so appropriate for us to be so specific in our suggested amendments. It doesn't mean we're going to get this exact language, but we should tell them what we're looking for. If there was somebody else leaning on it, maybe we could step back and let them do it, but without any other transit agency willing to say, we'll support this if you make these amendments, we kind of have to be the ones, and hopefully what we can do is negotiate amendments that not only get us to a support position, which is our goal, otherwise why would we say we would support if amended, but that will make other transit agencies feel comfortable in support. Because if we can't get the majority of the transit agencies in the Bay Area to support this bill, we're not gonna have a measure. <laughs> we're not gonna pass a measure. I mean, I don't even think we'll have a measure because why go forward with a measure without the support of even transit agencies? Not to even speak of all the other interest groups we need supporting it to have a successful measure. So um, again, to the folks at Seamless, let, let's keep talking, but I think we are the ones leading here and that's why we have to be specific, um, but, but happy to talk more offline about it. And again, just really appreciate the work and, and I know you have more to do on the other amendments we're looking at, but I, I think this is a great start. Thank you for your comments, Director Salzman. I only have one other speaker in the queue, Director Ames. Yes, I, um, I do appreciate uh, Seamless Bay Area's comments. That really resonates with me. That's what I <coughs> basically shared with staff yesterday at five o'clock. Thank you for having the briefing that late. Um, and <clears throat> I, I did think that the, uh, maybe we can go to the slides. Uh, what is this, let's see. The la I think it was the last two slides, or not the very last one. Um, yes, okay. So this overall, the guardrails really was alarming to me. And um, it's good to know where the operators are right now. Obviously this is, they don't want a lot of MTC interference. But I think that's part of the problem with coordination is MTC is really restricted in a way. And we've got all these local agencies and they have all of their local funds and they try to get matching funds to get grants. And it's just, we need MTC to have more power, which this is why I like the bill. I think the senators did a really great job writing that bill. It, it's very robust. And there is room to grow and to change and to get and to figure out ways to work with the agencies. But to do this to me is, is too prescriptive. And I think this is part of the reason why there's a problem. I mean, I don't even want to talk about logos. I mean, we could do this later. I mean, I wouldn't worry about the logos. I would worry about more giving MTC some authority to do, you know, multi-jurisdictional type of type of assessments, you know coordinated assessments, like I talked about with the paratransit uh, earlier in the meeting. Um, 
And so the next, uh, what's the next slide here? Hold on, do you mind? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't, okay. I guess my issue with this is we're already providing funds for operating, right? And there's some capital also in this bill. So I don't think it's necessary to add on to this and say, okay, in any, you know, in any event, we need more flexibility. I think the bill is pretty good at, at, at defining like what's operating and what's capital. And we don't need more flexibility to maybe switch capital funding to operating. I just don't, I think this is a little bit over the top, but I'm willing to look at this a little bit further. The other slide is, is more of a problem for me. And then um, let's go to the consolidation slide. Maybe we can hit some, some home runs here, okay? <laughs> um, I mean, frankly, I would like to see the consolidation at least started, the assessment started before the, the bill goes through. Um, I mean, before the vote, I should say. But I do, I do understand this issue where, you know, you need more time. So to me, I'm open to these ideas. I'd rather have it, I'd rather have the, you know, the consolidation assessment done now, start this now. It's very complex. There's nothing certain what's going to happen with this. But at least we'll get buy-in from the agencies, and then there'll be less fear, I think, moving forward. I think it's just the fear of the unknown, uh, which makes sense. This is why it looks a little bit... Uh, too prescriptive. And finally, um, just to go over the, it, it would be good to kind of go over the, the, the focus areas of SB 1031. And really, if you go drill down into this bill, which is, you know, not very exciting to read, uh, you know, it's got transit transformation, accelerating initiatives, safe streets, support connectivity, close gaps for climate neutrality, investments to support resilience, uh, protect communities from sea level rise, fires, extreme heat. And then those are the focus areas. And there's four priorities. It's funding operations and shortfalls. That's a thumbs up. That to me, operators should be happy to see this. Um, enhanced transit frequency that makes, that's financially stable. So we're not asking you, the agencies to, you know, be in a position where they're going to be sacrificing their agency. It's a sustainable um, way to approach transit, enhancing transit frequency. It's not going to bankrupt anybody. Um, then it's connect uh, seamless, connect and, see, and have seamless travel with implementation of the 2020 Transformation Action Plan. This is our plan that everybody worked on. All the operators worked on this. And I think, can, you know, including this as a, you know, a, a priority is important. Um, and I just want to go, just, I just, you know, we'll look at this here, the action plan here. Appendix I, transformation action plan goals and objectives. It goes through so many details. I mean, to me, this is our, this is a good starting point to get collaboration and not do these numerous addendums um, because it's got a lot of information in here that's already, we're already going to deploy. It's develop, well, I, I guess I don't want to go too much into this. It just says, you know, there's a lot of stuff here. Goal four, establish how current MTC and state transit initiatives should integrate with network management and governance reforms. So this is a starting point that I think we can use. And uh, many of these addendums I, or assessment or addendums here I can't support, but the consolidation piece I think is the, is the most encouraging that I could compromise on if that makes sense. So I think it's a good start, and I, I think the bill is well written. And I think all of the fears would potentially dissipate if we just started some consolidation, or I don't know what, what you want to call this, the study that needs to happen at a sub-regional level. Maybe if we start this process, it could, it could help the measure. You know, I just know that MTC looked at this in 2012, they looked at consolidation. I found, and I sent that to staff last night after our meeting. And maybe you can pass that on to the operators and remind them, because I didn't know that existed. But MTC was trying to consolidate and look at efficiencies that long ago. So we're really, this is really a historic moment, and I hope we can get to a, a, an agreement. 
Thank you. Thank you, Director Ames. Uh, I'm in concurrence with many of your comments, along with Director Lee and Director Salzman. Uh, and I appreciate the public comments, particularly from the Seamless Group, uh, who have been really leading this for, for years now. And uh, we're at the stage where we're actually seeing the opportunity for this coordination between agencies, and it's happening. Uh, my immediate goals are to build consensus among our transit peers and deliver the enhanced transit coordination that we're already seeing uh, play out in the wayfinding signs in Clipper 2. Uh, and to, at the same time, we will have to guard local control. Uh, in, in many ways, the, we, we can't be dictators. This is an opportunity for us to continue the dialogue with our partners uh, throughout. The one quibble I had with your comment, Director Ames, uh, regarding uh, there's no need for flexing capital and operating funds. There's been a lot of discussion at the federal level recently to allow for uh, that flexibility. And that's something that it's not going to solve our budget woes. Essentially, we can't sell out our state of good repair in order to keep operating trains. Of course, we have to have both. But um, you know, I do see the need to be able to flex and, and allow the budget departments to identify opportunities where, uh, as we're doing, to uh, flex funds, to also defer uh, funding of projects, but uh, whatever's necessary to keep the lights on is absolutely critical for us. Um, I think that the enhanced coordination is something that's really uh, I, underway through general manager powers every Monday morning meetings. And would you care to elaborate on the the tone of those meetings and you know what what your perspective is in chatting up uh, with the general managers of all these so they, organizations? Yeah, I could say a few words on that, Director Rayburn. The, the meetings have been fundamentally in place since COVID hit, um, I don't know, for, you know, since four years ago or so, whenever, whenever that date was. Um, the date and time has held, been held you know, to very sacred. And so we all, all GMs are showing up at 9 a.m. on Monday. And it's been going on for you know, four years. And um, you know, the agenda is co-created. I send it out on a Thursday or a Friday. Um, everybody shows up Monday. Uh, it's very collaborative. It's very informative. We're sharing ideas. We're sharing best practices, who's doing what. Um, and it really has brought the transit community closer together, which has benefited the riders. And we're gonna to continue to do that. And, you know, we bring in MTC, we bring in elected officials when we need to. It's very, uh, a very thoughtful and very informative meeting. That's very much appreciated. Thank you. The one item that I would like to add, and I brought it up with you yesterday, and it's with regard to the transit co consolidation element. And I've heard from a number of folks that have suggested that we simply not allow any further uh, new agencies to be formed. That if we're proposing uh, expanded service in an area of the Bay Area, that uh, it come under the wings of existing operators. I don't know what the feelings are amongst my colleagues to make that request. Uh, I don't see that it would cause a lot of damage and it could, again, help us achieve uh, more of a kumbaya around this very important measure. 
Any, just any comments briefly on just that matter? Not hearing anything, I'll uh, let it sit, but I'm not hearing necessarily a second uh, in support of that idea. But let's, uh, I feel that you have provided us with excellent points and uh, I hope, I wish you the best <laughs> uh, tomorrow with the MTC. I hope. I hope to see uh, some reflection of these principles uh, with the MTC and then when we bring it back and to, again, our desired outcome is to achieve a full support from not only BART, but from the Bay Area transit groups and success at the ballot in 2026. Thank you. Next, we will address the El Cerrito BART station transit Thank you. oriented and, development. And Mr. Chairman, as people come up, I do want to just advise that we will not go into closed session until we finish this item and then any board matters that we have. So, great. Uh, thank you, Chair Rayburn. So on the El Cerrito Plaza, again, this is an information item. We're joined today by Carly Payne, who's our acting director of transit oriented development. Matt Lewis, a Principal Property Development Officer, and Rachel Factor, a Principal Planner. I'll turn it over to Carly. Good afternoon, uh, Directors. Oh, okay. um, really pleased to bring you this update on the El Cerrito Transit Oriented Development Project. Um, this project exemplifies our approach to transit oriented development. It's creating housing opportunities, enhancing ridership, and upgrading transportation infrastructure, not only for the future residents, but also for the broader neighborhood and really um, creating a, a more livable community. So I'm gonna turn it over to Matt, who's going to talk about the project's progress and working with the development team, and then Rachel will talk about some of the access improvements that are envisioned, thank you. So the, <coughs> the El Cerrito Plaza um, transit area development principally concerns the three uh, surface parking lots that surround the El Cerrito Plaza station that are serving our uh, riders currently. Uh, the the station is the station is close to the uh, the border of El Cerrito, southern border of El Cerrito, with the city of Albany. It's next to El Cerrito Plaza Shopping Center the San Pablo Avenue Commercial and Transportation Corridor, and the Ohlone Greenway uh, bike and pedestrian path runs through it as well. So currently the uh, BART Rider parking lots are serving uh, 742 parking spaces. And the uh, developable acreage for the TOD is about six acres. So here I'm um, presenting some of the goals and objectives that were adopted by the BART board in uh, 2021 concerning the transit-oriented development here. And the plans from the uh, city that uh, relate to the, the site are you know, consistent with that and, and shown on, on the right here in, their, in terms of their title pages. So the BART board's been engaged in this development since 2016, and currently we're in an exclusive negotiating agreement with the two developers that we chose. Um, that agreement expires in August of 2024. The two developers are Holiday Development, uh, which is coordinating the market rate phases, and Related California, which is coordinating the subsidized affordable phases, and they're teaming up on an unsubsidized affordable phase that's serving the missing middle, and they'll for each phase, they'll be partnering with Factory OS, which is a modular manufacturer of uh, housing. The team's made significant progress on entitlements recently. They're um, on track to having the master plan fully entitled in the next few months under AB 2923. And BART staff, City of El Cerrito staff, and the development team have all collaborated on several successful funding applications. We've secured about 50 million in um, funding for housing and infrastructure at the site. So 
the project in total will deliver 743 new residences, 47% um, of which will be affordable at various levels. It's high density, it has low uh, parking for residents and ample bike parking for residents as well, all combining to create a truly transit-oriented community as envisioned under uh, AB 2923 as well as under city policy. There'll be several attractive new public amenities including a potential public library pending uh, voter authorization and funding for it, and a, a new public plaza leading up to the BART station along Fairmont Avenue as pictured in this rendering here. And then the funding that we've secured for the uh, station access improvements will enable the project to move forward expeditiously, as well as preserve access for BART riders once the surface park um, has been developed. Principally, BART stands to benefit from the project uh, by generating more ridership as well as uh, fare box revenue. Uh, we're seeing you know, ridership down significantly at this station from pre-pandemic levels, and the surface parking lots are utilized at about an average of 40% um, during the, the, the week. It's also a placemaking opportunity for the city of El Cerrito to establish its downtown. Uh, it'll create a home for a new library for the city and it'll help the city meet its obligations to produce new housing under the state RHNA arena allocation system. So the three surface parking lots are divided into um, six phases or independent buildings. The um, market rate buildings are shown here in yellow and the uh, affordable are, sh are shown here in orange. I'll just quickly run through them, but the, uh, the first project that would uh, move forward under the tentative schedule we have now would be Parsley South, it's the affordable development that related is coordinating. Uh, next up would be Parcel B, uh, the market rate development that Holiday is coordinating that also includes the Bart Rider parking. Uh, following that would be Parcel C East and Parcel C West, two affordable phases by related, and Parcel C West includes the uh, space for the new library. Then parcel D, the missing middle affordable development. And finally, parcel A north, the, the other market rate development. And I'll uh, pass it now to Rachel Factor. We'll go through the access improvements. All right, thank you. Um, so here I'm providing some, some of the access context. Um, so as you can see from the pie chart on the left, about 66% of the riders at El Cerrito Plaza get to the station without needing to drive and park, and this has been historically increasing over the last several years, uh, decreasing the need to ride, uh, drive and park, sorry. Um, and then as you see on the right, for those who do drive and park, about seven in 10 live within a, a reasonable 15 minute walk, bike, or transit ride. Noting that this data doesn't include e-bikes, uh, which would increase how many people could get to the station without needing to drive and park. So when we plan for TOD projects, as has definitely been the case at El Cerrito Plaza, we're not just focused on the buildings, we're also working with the jurisdictions and community to plan for the improved multimodal access around the station. So many of the access recommendations came out of extensive multi-year planning efforts uh, with significant community engagement, including dozens of in-person and virtual meetings over several years. And here this slide is showing some of the funded pedestrian improvements integrated into the site plan. So I'm just going to highlight a few. Um, an expanded Ohlone Greenway, which provides completely se separated access for peds and bikes on the east side of the station. Bulb outs and high visibility crosswalks throughout. Bike station with around 215 to 275 spaces, including for larger e-bike cargo bikes. Uh, East-West bikeway along Central that will provide an incredibly needed east-west bike access uh, from San Pablo up to Ashbury. Uh, class three sharrows along Richmond, and uh, the city's also looking into bikeway feasibility along Fairmount. And this slide shows some of the transit and car access improvements that we're looking, uh, that are funded. Um, so one is the reconfiguration of the busway, which is currently a one-way a one loop road to a two-way configuration, which will include multiple amenities and improved experience for bus riders. 
Um, and as Matt mentioned, the parking garage, which will be integrated into um, the building B here. So as far as next steps, we're negotiating the financial term sheet with the developers, and we'll seek authority to enter into a lease option. We're also, we also partnered with Related California on their ASIC grant application for Parcel A South, which could clear the way for the project to start construction in 2025. And we'll continue to work with the city on all the station access related pieces, including the on-street parking management program that the city is going to be initiating, as well as all the other infrastructure elements. Thank you. That's very good. I would expect uh, to see some comments from the directors, particularly Director Salzman. Uh, but first, let's hear from the public. Any comments? Yes, I see that we have uh, Glenn Overton in the audience. Great. And then I think another uh, speaker, and then we do have several hands on Zoom. Good. I really appreciate um, the development of land use through the BART corridor. It shows a progressive attitude. It shows uh, you're thinking f about the future and also about the present. I'm a wannabe historian of sorts. And uh, what comes to mind is Marie Antoinette. Let them eat cake. <laughs> and then we know what the hordes did. <laughs> In fact, I visited that site where they were beheaded. <laughs> Not to be cynical about that. But uh, essentially what I'm saying is thanks for uh, considering the housing needs in the Bay Area. Balancing that with affordability along that quarter. Thank you, Mr. Overton. I have an in-person speaker card from Jamie Heitshaw. Welcome, and you have three minutes. Good afternoon, directors. My name is Jamie Heitshaw with Holiday Development, one of the members of the development team for this great project. Um, on behalf of the entire development team uh, from Holiday and Related California, along with our design team, we want to thank you for your consideration of this master plan. Uh, we also want to thank and acknowledge the tireless work of both BART staff and City of El Cerrito staff uh, to bring this project forward. Um, we're really excited by the progress that we've made so far. As you've seen, there's been some real nice wins in terms of funding for infrastructure as part of this project. And again, a very collaborative effort to bring forward the entitlements process with both BART and the city. Um, as you saw in the presentation, there's a lot of really exciting parts of this development. Um, I think first and foremost for us is 743 units of housing with over 350 affordable for both low-income and middle-income families. Um, and then the infrastructure is critically important as well. There will be uh, both secured vehicle and bike parking delivered as part of this development for BART riders. Um, a new uh, infrastructure, reimagining of the bus access to the station. Um, and all of this has come through the collaboration with not just BART TOD staff, but BART staff from across departments. Um, and we're really confident that not only will we deliver housing, but we'll really improve the multimodal access to this station when the project comes forward over the next few years. So thank you again for your time and consideration, and we look forward to moving this project forward. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your comments with us, Mr. Heitschu. And do we have commenters online? Yes, we do. Welcome. So, so we'll go to Council Member Paul Fidelli. Please go ahead. Yes, good afternoon, uh, Board President Dufty and Board members. I'm Paul Fidelli. I'm a council member from El Cerrito, and I just wanted to connect on behalf of our full council today to thank BART and the developers for a great partnership over the years at El Cerrito Plaza TOD project. 
In 2016, our council unanimously directed that this partnership move forward. And in 2020, when I was pro, uh, pro Tem, Mayor Pro Tem, I came to your board to thank you for your cooperative efforts to anchor a new public library at the Plaza Development, a significant asset for both our city and the TOD project. With all the surprises that COVID, high interest rates and construction delays have brought, we in El Cerrito continue to be excited about what this housing project means to us. We now are working toward a ballot measure in El Cerrito with the support of our council and hopefully our residents. When construction is complete, our local BART station near retail will have been the impetus in housing hundreds of new residents at all income levels, increasing BART ridership and bringing a multifaceted library center along a redesigned Fairmont Avenue in a new town center. It's very exciting to us. I wanna thank BART again, especially General Manager Bob Powers and the dedicated BART staff for this. And going forward, I'm looking forward to working together to get this done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Council Member Fideli. Next speaker is Shahan. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jahan Byrne. Um, I live more than a mile away from BART and this station. And despite strong concerns and opposition from residents and riders, um, this is where we are. 742 rider parking spots will be down to just 145. That's less than 20%. Just an estimated of 260 tenant parking spaces are planned, even with about 1,300 to 1,800 spaces needed, and that's using MTC statistics on vehicles per household. If I, if there is no option to park, people will likely drive or take rideshare services to where they need to go. How is that going to help with promoting public transit and removing cars from the road? You are not a housing agency. You are a public transportation agency, and you're not a, a booster for El Cerrito's plans either. Um, to help get them out of their fiscal crisis. You're supposed to provide low cost, efficient transportation. And here's one scenario that I gave to uh, BART directors and uh, staff, just to see how problematic this will be. There's a single parent that commutes from El Cerrito Plaza to San Francisco each day. After work, this parent rides BART back to the plaza, jumps in a car and picks up her two children from preschool before 6 p.m. This parent relies on the reserved parking spots to ensure their children can be picked up before the school closes. If there's no station parking, the parent would have to hunt around for blocks and blocks in the morning with no guarantee of parking. If they park far away, the long walk to the station will make them late for work. And on the return work from home, they would have to race to their car parked on a random street and pick up their children. A bicycle, bus, or rideshare option is simply not feasible. Removing parking forces parents to make tough choices about childcare or even where they could work you would have removed a critical component, daily parking, for their ability to work and care for children. I would also say that survey that BART keeps pointing to is inherently flawed. It took, observe, it took stated behavior of what people said they do in terms of how they get to BART and not observed behavior. In fact, BART itself said, this survey does not provide a comprehensive view of travel behavior and relies on stated preference and stated behaviors instead of observed behaviors. This um, is basically a project that is on a juggernaut without enough public input. And if you think there's going to be a golden shovel groundbreaking ceremony in the future, think again, because I think the people of El Cerrito and the riders will continue to use political, legal, and legislative channels to address these concerns and delay this project until those voices are heard. Um, thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Melanie. Melanie, please go ahead. Uh, good morning or good new time, uh, BART board directors and staff. My name is Melanie Mintz and I'm the City of El Cerritos Community Development Director and I'm pleased to be here today, you know, a long awaited um, uh, meeting with you all as we've been making, as you can see from your staff presentation, lots of progress. So as Councilmember Fideli said, the city 
has had a long-term uh, goal and vision and of uh, developing our downtown and uh, developing the BART station with all kinds of shared goals of improving transportation, placemaking, um, some economic development, and obviously a substantial amount of housing. Um, all of our economic development plans actually, just like your ridership goals, show that housing is, is the way to support our local businesses, bring in new businesses, um, and support the various uh, transit options. We, we're, we're working hard uh, on a lot of street, on-street uh, related improvement, transportation improvements. And to the previous speaker's point, we are also working hard to be able to provide on-street parking for BART patrons, library patrons, com and commercial visitors, guests, et cetera. So as you saw in the presentation, the first building will hopefully break ground sometime in 2025-26. And the final buildings, hopefully by 2028. So during that time, uh, with the support of various grants that we have collectively obtained, we are developing an on-street uh, parking program, um, recognizing, uh, as a previous speaker, uh, speaker uh, referenced, that not everybody will be able to walk or ride. That said, we look forward to all the improvements that will, will expand uh, the walkability and uh, bikeability in the area. Uh, but also do recognize uh, that that people's circumstances still do uh, require that they can link their trips. And uh, so I just wanted to say our staff is, is of course, uh, like BART staff and the development team, uh, put a lot of time into this project. It's an incredible uh, lift and collaborative effort. Uh, the development team related and Holiday have been excellent partners. Uh, they're architects. Uh, they really share the vision uh, for making this a feasible, viable, exciting uh, project. So I'm here for any questions if you want any, but just wanted to, from the staff side, say uh, how much this project um, fulfills many local goals, including, of course, uh, uh, a significant portion of our regional housing needs element, and we look forward to the ongoing partnership. Thank you. All right, and the final speaker in the queue is Nick. Nick, please go ahead. Good afternoon, BART directors and staff. Uh, this is Nick Wilder with Related California Affordable. We are uh, partners with Holiday Development and uh, Saha on this uh, exciting uh, development at the El Cerrito Plaza BART station. We just wanted to thank uh, City of El Cerrito staff, BART staff, and the BART directors for all of their work over the last several years um, to, to help bring this vision to a reality. Um, and we'd also like to thank the uh, citizens of El Cerrito for all their engagements uh, in our many uh, community meetings, uh, pop-up events at the station uh, to hear um, excitement for the project as well as uh, the concerns around uh, this development. We're very excited uh, to bring over 700 units of housing, incredibly needed housing, to a uh, immediately next to a transit station. This will be housing for extremely low income, low income, moderate income, and market rate tenants. Those 700 units of housing are estimated to bring over 2,000 uh, new residents uh, to the area, many of which uh, will be BART riders. Uh, at the station. Not only will this project bring incredibly needed housing and with that housing, new BART riders, but it will also leverage tens of millions in state financing that will go directly towards uh, BART station related and access infrastructure, uh, new dedicated bike lanes, redone Ohlone Greenway bike and pedestrian lane, a new bus only lane, a new bike station, a new public plaza, and the potential new El Cerrito library housed within one of the uh, buildings that Related is leading the efforts on uh, an affordable building. So this is much more than housing. It's really a comprehensive redevelopment of this area and an everything and all approach uh, to access of the station. So again, just want to express my thanks uh, to all those involved, particularly uh, the BART staff presenting today uh, for their tireless work on this exciting project. Thank you. Thank you very much for commenting, Nick. 
There are no additional hands raised. Great. I'll turn to the board members. Uh, Ames, Simon, then Foley. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited to see the layers of different levels of housing um, supported by this development. The, of course, missing middle, which is 80% AMI income level. It's really exciting to see this. Uh, I guess <clears throat> my main concern is the parking. I've seen these kind of projects not go very well, like in Hayward, South Hayward. They did affordable housing there. Uh, this is in my district, but um, a lot of them don't take transit. Uh, they park on the street. And um, the reality is a lot of the people that are in affordable category, they have multiple jobs, multiple excursions, and they need a car. So I know the vision sounds great, you know, to, to, to do this kind of village where people don't need to drive and you could shop, you could walk across the street and go to the shopping center, you could walk across the street to the BART station. So I guess my problem is if the city is going to do a parking program, which I'm happy to hear, I guess I, I was a caller that um, talked about this, my, my concern would be, okay, if they do a parking program and they have on-street on -street parking, which they desperately need, because I've seen this go wrong in, you know, like South Hayward. Um, so uh, perhaps the developer or somebody could help contribute towards this managing of the parking that's going to happen out there. I don't know what this is going to look like, but I feel like we really should ask the developer to help contribute towards this parking solution. And I did meet with the developers, by the way, and they were very, they were, you know, I had a, a little briefing with them and they went over the project and I had brought this up and I asked them, you know, what is the public benefit that you provided? And uh, I didn't get a specific answer, but I did ask the staff about this and you said they would be paying for public art, correct? Is the public art fee that we're going to charge the developer? The, the public benefit for this project, there, there are multiple. Having nearly 50% of the units being affordable housing, I would say is the major public benefit. Also leveraging the project to um, secure millions in transportation infrastructure upgrades, I would say is the other pu another public benefit. I'm, I know the city of El Cerrito and residents are really, many of them, very excited about a library, which is a community resource and asset, another public benefit. Um, they will comply with any art requirements, which I know El Cerrito has, as does BART. Um, so I think broadly those are the portfolio of public benefits. Um, I would say on the issue of regulating parking, I think we need to leave it to the city to exercise their authority and not get involved with saying that the developer needs to have a role in what is actually the city's authority over managing the street and the curb. But I, I hear your comment and I know we have our city of El Cerrito representative um, listening. And so I'm sure she will, they, they will consider your suggestion as well. Okay, and I understand there's a lot of public benefit and we got grants and all of this, but I would like to see a little bit more on the parking. I don't know what that public benefit would look like. Perhaps a developer can pay for transit passes. Um, that's part of the, the contract they have with the, the building manager or whatever, however they're managing this situation. Um, is it like a homeowner fee type deal when, they, when people buy these homes or is, how is this gonna be structured? This will be rental and there is a, um, they're in the process of developing their transportation demand management plan based on both our requirements and the city of El Cerrito's requirements and is just, yeah. so everybody has cleared a transportation demand management plan is a plan to um, what measures will be in place to really support and enhance all of the walking, biking, transit, car sharing options that exist and incentivize the use of those so that the future residents are really set up for success in making as many of their trips as possible um, in modes other than cars and leave the car spaces and the car the space on the streets for those who really need them. 
Yeah, I guess the reality is there's going to be a lot more cars on the street. This is the problem with these developments. Um, I just see I just see this happening, and the, the vision is great. I just hope that we can have a better management of the parking. And also, I had talked about uh, closing that street down. I, what was that street that goes connects to the shopping mall? Fairmont. Fairmont, thank you. Um, that's great to see that they're going to have events there to close the street down. But I think <coughs> with people with groceries and people that have families, they've got maybe wagons or something, they need to easily cross over to the retail and not navigate, you know, through this street poten potentially. I've seen main streets getting closed down to promote this walkable area on the street. But, you know, that's a controversial thing to close down the street. You can't just do that. But I am happy to see that they're going to do events. And maybe eventually this could be a pilot that the city explores to close that street down at some point to get the access for the people to walk and shop and play and all of that. Um, I think the vision is, I mean, I think it's, it could happen, but I believe that the parking piece and this walking with groceries and that whole, that whole nexus needs a little bit more work. But maybe the city is working on this and we can have a better conversation later. But I love the project. I just, I just, that's the only part. Everything else is fantastic. So thank you. Sorry. I want to uh, make a sincere apology that my uh, screen did not show uh, Rebecca Salzman. It was a technical issue. Uh, of course, as the uh, representative of this station who shepherded this project through uh, years of community meetings, uh, Rebecca, would you please make your comments? Maybe I could say yes. something quickly before her because I think that it's her project and she should, you want to finish it out. Um, and, and really, my thanks, thank you, Chair, thank you. is to Rebecca, who I know has worked so hard. And if you have worked with this staff on a TOD project, it is every other day. Um, and your negotiations with the mayor, this wonderful team who is out at, you know, flower stands and farmers markets, the engagement to get to this point is so critical. And the other thing I wanna say, Director Salzman, and you know this all too well, living in El Cerrito, owning a home there, knowing that your constituents, many are renters. If you go on zelle.com right now and you're trying to find an apartment under $3,000 for a two bedroom under 1,200 square feet right now in a full city, there are less than 15 listings. So for folks who don't own and who have to navigate themselves to the BART station, I love AC Transit, but it's not always very easy. So to have the opportunity to have hundreds of low and middle income units for generations to come, we really Really, working with this city, working with residents, working with our staff, we will change together collaboratively the dynamics of a thoroughfare that is underutilized and has been underutilized for literally decades. Folks being able to see and feel the beauty of their city attached to what we know is an amazing BART station for so many folks is a dream come true, a block from DMV a block from City Hall, a block from other city and social services. Um, thank you all, because the work, I know it hasn't been easy, and I know all the neighbors, we got to bring folks along, and it will be incredibly frustrating, but essentially, we're building housing now for the generation who's here today, but really, if we think about the next 60 to 80 years, how the Bay Area will change, we will be hopefully very, very happy from wherever we will be in the ethers to have made a really good decision to support El Cerrito's current and future. Thank you, Director Salzman, for your leadership here. Thank you. Thank you, Director Simon. I, I appreciate those words. And thank you to the team for all of your work you've done on this. We've been doing it a long time now. And if the folks from the city are, are still on the Zoom, thank you all for your work. Um, El Cerrito is a small city. This is a really big project for the city. Um, so they've used a lot of their capacity making this a priority. Um, and then thank you also to the development team, to, to Jamie who's here, and to the, the whole rest of the team um, for all their work on this project. This is just such a transformative project for the city. Um, I use this BART station several times a week. Uh, it is one of the largest developable sites in the city. 
mean, the fact that we're going to meet half of the city's RENA goals with this project, I mean, other cities would, would dream to have that happen. Uh, it's, it's really huge. Um, and the housing is probably the biggest thing, but what it's going to do to improve the whole neighborhood is just huge because um, though I think retail has been doing better in El Cerrito than maybe some of the other cities that are kind of more dependent on office workers, it's still always a struggle for retail. And so for the, the numerous retail shops that are within walking distance already and what could you know ultimately become El Cerrito's downtown, having more residents there is going to make a really huge difference. Um, and then the upgrades that are being made to access are, are also huge. Um, it right now can be challenging to navigate those streets on a bike or as a pedestrian, but all of these improvements will make that so much easier. And these are small streets. They're kind of sized sort of already in the right way, but with the increase in speeding all over the Bay Area and the country since the pandemic, people are still flying down them. So the bull bouts, the bike lanes, the things that'll slow down traffic even more, it's gonna help you know, make it safe to, to cross the street. Um, and to make it easy to get there. And then, you know, something that's maybe unsung in this project is the, the, um, the bus improvements. Right now, the bus waiting areas at the station are maybe the worst at any station I've ever been to, and I probably would have tried to address it years ago if this project wasn't coming. It's really unpleasant. I've waited for the bus there many times. It's quite unpleasant. Um, so having improved bus stops that like actually have benches and shelter around them will, will be really huge. Um, so the improvements are big. And then on the parking, you know, this was going to be a challenge pre-pandemic, and I think even pre-pandemic we had a good plan in terms of there'd be some parking replaced, but also what the city's doing. I mean, there's been the, the study done on the city streets, and there's a lot of parking available on city streets. They just don't manage it at all because they haven't needed to. There's no managed parking in the entire city, which is kind of wild. So managing that parking will mean that there's enough spots, not just for BART parkers, but for people accessing the shops, the libraries, everything else like that. There's definitely enough parking in the area. And I, I can tell you my walk to BART, I walk through the parking lot where the first development is going because it saves me some time. Um, I walked through this morning at 820 and there were four cars parked in that parking lot. It's, you know, the least used of the parking lots, but that just gives you a flavor that there's a lot of available parking today. Um, and so I think we're, we're doing the right thing with the parking and what the city is doing. I, I, I understand some people are concerned about change, but I, I think what we're doing will be enough and probably more than enough and help as the city grows in other ways with other developments. Um, so I know this is just informational, but you know we've, we've had support of this board in the past for this project and I, I hope we will continue to. Thank you very much for those comments. Uh, Director Foley followed by Director Allen. Thank you, Chair Rayburn. Um, first off, thank you to staff. I wanna say thank you to Holiday and Related as well. You all provided me with great briefings on this project, so I truly appreciate that. And all of the energy and effort that went into getting us here today um, and in a closed session. Um, that said, um, I am also very appreciative that this brings much needed missing middle housing. Um, it isn't just the affordable piece, but there are folks in the middle that need this. So this is a great project to address that as well. Um, but there are always concerns. Um, going from the 742 spaces down to 145, that's a loss of 600 spaces. Um, which is not insignificant, um, even if there are only four people currently parking in there. Um, but I, I will say that, you know, BART's, we're a transit agency, um, but our side hustle is TOD. Um, and I don't see why AC Transit shouldn't have a related side hustle in trying to help address the housing concern. If we remove parking in order to accommodate housing, then AC Transit should be there to help accommodate new bus service, an additional bus service. I think any TOD project, when we remove home parking, needs to look at how do we encourage people to get out of their car and get to the station. Um, I also do think we have an obligation 
to mitigate neighborhood parking impacts. We're the ones that are taking away 600 parking spaces, and we're the ones that are gonna welcome riders to this beautiful station. And I think our role in the community is, how do we help mitigate those impacts on the neighborhood and the community? Um, you know, I, I think in a bigger picture, we have to look at what, what's the greater good? Is housing greater of a need than a partially used parking lot? And I think for me, the answer is it's housing. Um, but with that being said, it needs to, to pencil out for us, for BART. It needs to really be revenue positive for BART. And so I think we have to be very concerned about what do the term sheets, what do the ground leases look like that will bring in long-term sustainable revenue that would exceed what we would have gotten from the parking. Um, that's really what we're trading here. And again, trading it for the right reason, but we are giving away revenue and we have to find a way to balance that. Um, and uh, I guess lastly, I will throw my, you know, concern out there about, I, I am a bit skeptical that we really, we don't have any demonstrated proof that TOD generates a significant number of new riders. And, and that's the one thing that tends to hold me back on TOD and the loss of parking is um, we're kind of looking into a crystal ball and trying to assume what would the ridership look like. Um, but we haven't been able to demonstrate that yet. So that's the one thing for me as a director that's challenging when I look at TOD projects. Thank you, Chair Rayburn. Thank you. Next, Director Allen. Thank you, um, and, and thank you, Director Foley. I appreciate much of what you just said. I would have echoed much of the same. Um, so I will just cut to one question that I have, and it's really just sort of jumping off of those comments. Um, is Has BART done a cash flow analysis uh, for the project? To BART, uh, not to the developer. Well, Director, we're gonna, uh, after this item, we have a closed session item to talk about the financials of the project. Okay, but that, that's great, but is there a cash flow analysis report that has been done? Usually consultants do these. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> we do have that available. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very excited about this project, and um, I was pleased to hear uh, Melanie Mintz weighing in from the city of uh, El Cerritos Public Works, and uh, I've seen the results of some of the hard work that she's done along with Rachel Factor uh, at BART um, in the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Community Grant application. It's proposed a number of new transit, pardon me, uh, bike access improvements, and it's added uh, most recently additional bus bulb outs. Uh, these are, I think, eight eight point eight million dollars worth of projects will be delivered in the community uh, through this grant, uh, along with essential funding for getting a shovel in the ground on the affordable housing. So this is really great progress and building those partnerships is so important. I was also appreciative to hear our former colleague, Paul Fidelli, uh, and well, he's now a partner. And I want to wish you the best in getting that library uh, measure through, passed by the voters. I wanna share with everyone that Yours truly and my wife live at Fruitvale Village. Uh, we live on the third floor. The second and first floors are occupied by Arise High School, Cesar Chavez Library, Fruitvale Senior Center. Needless to say, these activity centers contribute to a vibrant intergenerational atmosphere Fruitvale Village is the center of the community. It once was a parking lot, and it was not the center. I'm, this is the desired outcome that I think we're all looking for. 
And part of that desired outcome is to see those students from Arise High School on the BART trains, they're there every morning and afternoon, to see the seniors coming in in the afternoon and, or late morning uh, for the senior center activities. And the seeing bookworms on the trains, our little uh, reader uh, that disperses po poetry at that station is one of the most used readers in the system. Uh, and they make good bookmarks as well. Uh, so uh, come visit uh, the Fruitvale Village, and I hope that I'll be able to visit the El Cerrito Plaza Library in the future. Thank you very much for all the hard work everybody's done to get this project to a point where we can really envision getting that shovel in the ground on this most essential affordable housing component. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and now we'll continue moving on with our agenda. We have board matters. I'm gonna start and then we will if you could indicate to me that you have an item you would like to bring up. So I wanna take a moment to uh, thank some of our unsung heroes who make it possible for the public to be aware of what we're doing, uh, whether online or uh, in, in other manners. And so I wanna thank our media and communication staff, Cheryl Stalter, communications officer, Steve Connell, multimedia producer, Anna Duckworth, communications officer, and then from our IT, Group, Travis Engstrom, Director of Technology, Fode Kareem, Supervisor of Business Systems Operations, Tom McDonald, Computer Support Coordinator, Scott Hansen, Computer Support Coordinator, Dave Devana, Cyber Sur I'm sorry, Cybersecurity Engineer, Alfonso Rigel, Executive Assistant, and Jeremy Amato, who works with us through his contract with One Workplace. Thank you all so much. And can I see interested hands in any direction who have items uh, from um, Board Matters, In Memoriam, and others? Director Allen. Um, thank you, President Dufty. I'm gonna ha hand down, actually, previous to this, an RCI has been handed down the dais to my colleagues here with respect to the BART to Silicon Valley to request oh, for information. Um, I'm gonna, and I'm now handing down a second RCI that I wish to introduce, and that uh, actually goes along with my comments during the workers' comp uh, award of contracts. Um, so I'm introducing here two RCIs. I'll start with the uh, BART to Silicon Valley two. This was developed by uh, my colleague, Director Ames, and I together and we introduced this together. We are looking for um, a third person to jump onto this, but in short, and it's actually um, a little over two pages long with requests for information regarding this project, but in short, I'll just read the, the summary. Um, we're gravely concerned about the course of the BART to Silicon Valley extension, including the constructability risks and cost efficiency of the project. Accordingly, we respectfully request BART executive management and subject matter expert staff to provide to the BART board of directors within 30 days of today a written, detailed, and comprehensive report followed by a public board meeting session that answers the following questions and provides the requested, the herein requested information regarding the BART to Silicon Valley 2 project. And there's a lengthy list of uh, 11 questions here, uh, 12 uh, questions and requests for information. Um, I've given this to the board secretary, I won't read it all, but um, hopefully it gets entered into the, um, the meeting record. So that's number one, and then the second uh, RCI I have is, as I said, related to an earlier item on the agenda, which we discussed, and it is uh, regarding the workers' compensation program assessment. Uh, and it says essentially what I said then, um, that the Aon actuarial report demonstrates BART self-insured workers' compensation program is performing poorly with this RCI. 
um, Director Ames and I, um, and I hope others would, would uh, agree. Um, we request that the following work be done by the Office of Inspector General and reported back to the board um, uh, on ways, and there might be a typo over here, <laughs> on, on ways to improve the process of BART's workers' comp program administration no later than six months from now on October 15th. And there are eight items there that specifically I am requesting, and I read those earlier in the board agenda item. So um, I, at this time, I, at this time, there are these RCIs. My only board report is I did speak, uh, I did a presentation to the um, Arinda Rotary this week regarding BART and its finances and our efforts for a safe and clean system. Um, do I Thank have you. any other directors willing to support the, either so of these? So I'm going to I'm going to let our, our general counsel just indicate the process because okay. we haven't had a lot of RCIs recently. So I just want to do that. So general counsel. Sure, absolutely. So just to make sure everyone's clear, an item an RCI being introduced requires a second endorsement by another director to be recorded as a roll call for introductions item. An item requested for placement on a future agenda requires a third endorsement by a director. I think that's what you're referring to. So by virtue of the fact that you've submitted this with a co-author, you are, you know, you are approved, so. Oh, okay, I just thought it needed a third person to actually put it to the agenda. I think that's correct. Okay, to so is the there agenda. a third person? Can I ask a question? Certainly. Uh, well, it'd be helpful to know on, I, I know we can't get into a discussion, but it'd be helpful to know from the GM on, this on the VTA one and from the inspector general on the workers comp, if they have capacity to do this in the time frame, um, those are, that's my main question. I mean, especially the 30 days, but also the six months, because this is a lot. I'm also just not clear on the workers compensation. Are you asking the office of the inspector general to select providers? I'm, I'm just no, unclear. That, that's not what it says. It, it's asking the IG to, um, to do eight items in with respect to analysis. It, I mean, it doesn't say that. Like, it says analyze the loss data, audit a sample, but it then says select providers. So I, maybe it's just I'm unclear. I don't think that's what oh, you're actually, asking to do. Yeah, okay, that's, yeah, that's that's the board item. We can just delete number eight there. Okay. The board would do that. You're okay. correct. I just I want to make sure we're clear. So I, I'd Last like part to of the hear process. from both the GM and the inspector general about capacity on these. Well, I... Director Salzman, we, you know, 30 days isn't going to work. Um, and any follow-up questions on what is the timeline? I'll have to, this was just, you know, presented right now, so um, I'll have to look at it. And, um, you know, some of this is certainly um, VTA's um, work effort and work product, and so there'll be a lot of cooperation and coordination there. So I, I can't comment on the timeline, but... Um, you know, we're in the middle of a lot of things, so let me take a look at it, and I'll get back to the board president about what is a reasonable timeline uh, for us to complete this request. Yeah. Thank you. Can I, can I just, uh, and I appreciate Claudette coming up, but um, there is some urgency. That's why I only did 30 days on this, because there is sort of a clock ticking at FTA with respect to the equipment that's been ordered. And so um, there's been a lot of this, this RCI came uh, as a result of a lot of feedback that came from uh, members of the public, retired engineers that are following the projects that have raised certain concerns. And also part of those concerns are that our board has not actually spent enough time looking into these particularly deep issues and the um, environmental impact reports and so forth. So that's the source. So President Dufty, my answer stands as stated. So I, I think there is, there is a legitimate capacity concern, and so I, we'll, we'll return to that. Inspector General, welcome. Hi, hi everyone, how's everyone doing? Well, I hope, <laughs> a little caught a little off guard, um, but no problem, I can handle it. So to address the questions or the, the, the request for the IG and the workers' compensation audit, I think some of those items will naturally flow 
um, once we dig in. We haven't officially started it yet. We just kind of identified it as a need, unrelated entirely to what was going on with the contract. Um, and my team and I are gonna meet and look into it and see what we can address and can't address. The only concern that kind of is out there is the six month timeline, that might be tight, um, but we'll see what we can do. So I would offer that I think that, you know, given the concerns that have been raised by our inspector general and the general manager, I don't think that it's appropriate to stipulate. I think that, that you know, this has to be looked at, it has to be assessed, it has to be considered within the overall work that's taking place and, you know, have conversations about that. So, um, I appreciate that, Director Dufty, and I'm, I'm willing to work within the timelines uh, that people feel are reasonable. However, I will point out that I actually produced RCIs back in 2018 that are still sitting on the RCI list and have never been addressed. So I, that's why I now put timelines on them, and I appreciate having conversation about what is reasonable. And I appreciate that, and I, I do want to offer that I had brought up at the last meeting that um, I think the RCIs need to be looked at because there's some that still um, are, are from Nick Josefowitz, for example, and so I, I do want to go through that and sort of work through that process, being respectful and talking to directors to see if issues are still outstanding, as well as understanding maybe things have happened, um, at, you know, at the at the staff level, but just have not been formally. Um, uh, entered to, to resolve. So that's on me, and I, I pledge to do that before our, our next meeting. Uh, Director Ames. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And I, I do appreciate staff's consideration on this and the board. I've never done an RCI. I'd never wanted to do an RCI because I know you're inundated with work. But this one, for the Barta San Jose project, you know, we've had Consist, I've had consistent questions posed to me. I can't answer them. This is a collaboration with the community, um, retired BART staff, you know, Barrier Transportation Working Group. I mean, you've, they've come to these meetings. They've come to the uh, BART de San Jose committee meetings. And now they're going to this, uh, what is the oversight committee? I forgot what this is called, Bob, but it's over, you know, there's an oversight committee looking at these issues. So I think it's very timely. I know it takes a long time to, to decipher and how to manage this, the, these questions and how to answer them appropriately, but I do think it's worthy to pursue these questions and put that out to the public for more transparency on this project that's gradually escalating in cost, as we know. So I appreciate your time and consideration on this, and I, I won't do any more IRCIs, okay? I'll just, I'll just put it out there. This will be it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, can I go down the, the road? Director Saltzman, do you have anything? Direct Vice President Foley? No, well, Director Rayburn, uh, Director Simon. Um, in terms of board reports, um, I had a wonderful weekend at the Ashley Flea Market with BART staff. Um, our Community Affairs Division, they show up to everything. Uh, the Ashley Flea Market, as you all know, has been uh, in operation for over 40 years. Uh, it's been tough over uh, the, the period during COVID and post, but BART has had a beautiful relationship with the, um, the wonderful vendors who really come from, you know, every sort of diasporic group in the Bay Area to, to share an economic opportunity from makers of, of artwork uh, to folks selling their home goods. It's, it's a beautiful place. If you have Menashby Flea Market, we have a lot to do pre and post the TOD development to make sure that it continues to be a thriving part um, of, of South Berkeley. But our BART staff is very aligned in the community and we went from vendor to vendor to vendor to vendor. Um, and those kind of opportunities are always just so special. So I wanna thank BART staff and Rod, your team is so great. Director Rayburn. Thank you very much, President Dufty. I had the pleasure of attending the East Bay Economic Development Association Innovation Awards Ceremony. It packed the Oakland Masonic Hall. And I was really pleased to see District Works, the organization that supplies our, uh, the ambassadors on the street and BART's elevator and restroom attendants. They received an innovation award uh, 
in front of everyone there. It was a, a great ceremony. They were excited to be acknowledged for their uh, wonderful service to uh, BART as well as the city of Oakland. This past week, of course, I've been at the, in Washington, D.C., at the American Public Transit uh, Association's legislative uh, meeting, and there's a lot to unpack. I, I'll do a little show and tell. This was a th the main theme, that public transit carries our economy. It's a, I, I think it's a very appropriate theme, and they didn't just select this willy-nilly. It was done through a coordinated survey of uh, people throughout the country. I want to share with you a few things about the meetings. On Sunday, uh, I had a whole series of committee meetings that I attended. Uh, it was, and I'll just share that during the state agencies and meeting, I opened up first uh, that morning with the key issue for BART and the Bay Area region is operations funding. And uh, it was well received. There were other members, uh, County Connection was in the room, the FTA, uh, Deputy Administrator Paul Kincaid was there. They heard uh, the, the need. And throughout the conference, I heard it reiterated, including the following morning during the opening session in the Grand Ballroom with over 500 people. I don't know, maybe more, Alex, you could perhaps help with the estimate, but I, I think I'm in the ballpark. And again, I grabbed the mic and shared that our operating deficit that's pending is number one in priority. And I asked the acting FTA administrator, Veronica Vanderpool, and the panel what they felt could be done to address that. And if it could be addressed in the upcoming transportation bill reauthorization. There were positive responses throughout that session, as well as in following sessions that there, the Highway Trust Fund needs to be uh, looked at uh, and new revenue sources, but operating revenue was mentioned a number of times with regard to the pending reauthorization for 2026. So there's a bit of a, a, just a glimmer of hope from that meeting. And then the following day after the opening session, and, and actually that opening session, we did take a break and we went out and watched the eclipse. So imagine uh, 500 people filing out of the building out to a uh, park across the street look up in the sky. But the following day, we went to Capitol Hill, hand delivered the letter to Representative uh, Hank Johnson's staff members, and uh, I have photos uh, to document. And we also knocked on a couple of other doors while we were in uh, at the, uh, in the Rayburn building, no less, uh, to urge support for this measure from the Bay Area delegation. And we finished up by meeting with uh, Senator, uh, pardon me, I should have written out my notes, Sen No, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. What a, what a mess. Yes. I have those moments every day. Yeah, I, I'm going through it. Uh, the senator's staff, California State, California Senator Adia. Adia, thank you very much. Welcome. Oh, man. 
that's horrible. Uh, his staff, Sam Mahood, who I do remember his name, was very receptive to the notion that uh, the Senate side take a look at Hank Johnson's bill that now has over 100 co-sponsors. And while it's not likely to move forward in this Congress, uh, it's likely to be folded in to that reauthorization. So uh, I feel like we're getting traction and I want to thank Alex Walker, you and Rob, and of course our lobbyists, uh, Emily Bakke and uh, Lynn uh, in Washington were superb in helping to facilitate that we could have our voices heard. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. We will now move into closed session for two items that we are considering, uh, and we will return to open session once we complete consideration. Um, I believe we have public comment uh, before we go to closed session. Yes, I don't see any hands on Zoom, but we do have a speaker in the audience, Glenn okay. Overton. Thank you. I've always wanted to be rescued out of that tube going under the bay. So I'm a volunteer. I, I used to, uh, I worked on a project that was 10 miles long, 50 feet wide, 12 foot high underground for the river to back up in. I want to be rescued out of that tube. But having said that, Boeing is in the news, you know, and you keep that in mind in terms of reliability. You know, thanks. Thank you. We'll now move into closed session and we will come back into open session when we conclude the closed session items. Sorry, your secret.
ready? We are back in session uh, after our closed session, and we will have um, nothing to disclose uh, following the consideration of these two items. This concludes our business for today, and our board meeting is adjourned in memory of Dexter, our canine pup.